Hi, Ryan. Hi, Julie. Going? Not too bad. <clears throat> I apologize for this camera view. This laptop has a camera down at the bottom, believe it or not. Well, I'm always looking up when I do these meetings because I have like everyone on my big screen and then I have like my camera on my little screen right here. So I'm always like looking yeah, up. So you guys are all in the heavens. <laughs> letting a few more people in. So it looks like we have everybody except for John. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. John. Hello. Whenever you're ready, we have everybody here. All right. Um, let's call this meeting a CPDC to order. Um, Julie, do you want to bring up the agenda or? Yep. I'll do a screen share right now with the okay. agenda. Please. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Um, let me just find it. Mm -hmm. All right. Does everybody see the agenda on the screen? Can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, let me just scroll down real quick. There's the Zoom information's right here. Do you want me to show the, the meeting items, John? Yes, please. Great. So um, here's our agenda for the night. Um, uh, I guess to start off, Julie, can you go over the, um, before we get into any of these, can you go over sort of the, the um, ground rules for, um, for Zoom and raising hands and that sort of thing? Yep. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Julie Mercier, Community Development Director. On the screen tonight, we have um, we also have Andrew McNichol, staff planner, um, and Ryan Percival, town engineer from the town of Reading Town Hall. Um, from the CPDC, we have John West in the chair. We have Nick Safina, Cam Adrian, Heather Plish, Rachel Hitch, and Tony Diarezzo. Hope I didn't miss anybody. Um, so 
basically the way this works is, you know, this is a meeting that's being held um, online over Zoom. The Zoom information is actually, I'm just going to pull it up on the screen right now for anyone who's watching from home who wants to participate. It's right here. Um, you can uh, go to the link where you can call in with the call in number and I'll let you in. Um, the there are a few features on Zoom that we that we typically use. So um, we ask that anyone who's not speaking be muted, and, and that will be most of you most of the time. Um, the way that this works is that we let the applicant give an overview of the project, and, and then the board has a chance to ask questions. And then once the board has asked questions, they will open it up for public comment. And so if, you if you're a member of the public and you have a comment at any time, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom, which is if you go down to the bottom of your screen and you click on participants, and then you go over to your name, there's an ellipsis and it should give you the option to raise your hand. And I will be monitoring that. So I'll be able to tell throughout the meeting if anyone has a question. We do, we will hold the public questions until it's the public um, hearing component of the, of the meeting. Um, if you are having technical difficulties, you can always use the chat feature in Zoom and you can chat me directly as the host. Um, please refrain from having person-to-person -person chats amongst yourselves during this meeting because this is an open meeting and we don't want to violate the open meeting law. But you can use it for technical questions to me if you want, um, if you need to. I'm also monitoring my, my work email. So if you're having any difficulty with the Zoom, but you still have internet and can email me and want to let me know, please do. Um, and I think that about does it for me. I'll turn it back over to you, John. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Julie. Um, so as you can see, the, um, the first item on our agenda is a public hearing for site plan review 1312 Main Street. Um, so I think we had a... I do have one thing to add. So this time we've actually asked the applicants development teams to do the screen shares so that they can use their cursors to kind of show the areas of the site that they're talking about. We think that might make the meeting go a little more smoothly and take some, some of the guesswork out of the equation for staff. Um, so. Great, it's a good idea. Um, I think, uh, right, uh, first thing we need to do is read the public notice, right? And so, all right. I'm trying to bring that up too. So I have it right here. Um, Pam, can I read it? Uh, Pam, you're on mute. All right. Okay. This is a notice of public hearing. Notice is hereby given that and under sections 4.3 and 4.6 of the Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission, CPDC, will hold a public hearing on Monday, September 14, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. through remote and online measures to hear the site plan review application submitted by Reading Animal Clinic for the property located on 1310 to 1312 Main Street, Assessor's Map 51, Lots 79 and 83. The applicant is proposing to construct a new approximate 10,500 square foot building to use as a new clinic and office that includes surface parking and associated site improvements. A copy of the application and accompanying plans are available to the public at town hall by appointment and on the town website the Thursday, on the Thursday prior to the hearing. Great, thank you. Thanks, Pam. So with that, um, is there someone from the development team? Yes, Sean, Brad Latham. All right, Brad. I apologize, it says Josh Latham. My son hijacked my Zoom. 
um, irrespective of that. And also, we have very limited Zoom lit literacy. So as far as the exhibits go, please bear with us. We'll do our best to, uh, to show them. Uh, I'm just going to start off with that, if I may. Sure. Before you, before you start, Brad, I just want to let you know, I had a previous commitment um, at 8 o'clock. And although we can't be in two places at the same time, I'm going to, I, I'll sign off at about eight o'clock and then re rejoin this meeting um, as soon as I can. But um, it's likely not to be while this, um, while we're still addressing this particular application. But I just wanted to let you know if I suddenly have to jump off that, um, that that's the reason and that's planned. So nothing personal. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, could I actually, Julie, could I just check on one thing? So, I'm a client or my dog is a patient at, at this animal clinic. Does that make a conflict of interest? I would hope not, but he's not I'm gonna not, be voting. Um, I'm not the one to determine that, um, but I believe a disclosure is usually a good place to start. Okay. And I do wanna say that when John jumps off, um, the care duties will be transferring to Pam Adrian, so. Shall I proceed? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Beth Sherlin is with us tonight. Uh, Jack Sullivan, the uh, professional engineer who's the project engineer. Uh, Charlie Cochran, who is the architect for the project. And Demetra Chisaris Rasusia, who is the uh, landscape designer for us tonight. Uh, the site, as I'm sure we all know, is on the westerly side of Main Street. Uh, it's number 312 Main Street and a lot next to that that's northerly that currently does not have a street number. Uh, it's in the Business A Zoning District. Uh, as has been said in the legal notice, the applications by Reading Animal Clinic, which has operated uh, a veterinarian facility here for over 78 years. Um, and uh, as has been identified, the patients are primarily dogs and cats, although other kinds of pets uh, are also serviced and uh, taking care of at this facility. The current location is cramped. Uh, the objective is to build a new building. Uh, and I think from you can see from this picture, it's a very attractive building. It'll better accommodate the needs uh, of the clinic uh, and will better serve the patients. Uh, one important point, and I, we've given the various numbers and Jack will go into this in more detail, but it meets all of the zoning requirements uh, and has, in some spaces, is uh, much more stringent than the zoning requirements uh, allow. Uh, the, uh, currently, there are three driveways that enter from the site onto Main Street. Uh, one of the positive additional features to this is that it goes down to one driveway, so there's better traffic control uh, on the site and this connection to Main Street. Um, there, there are uh, certain requests we have for waivers. I'll go through those so they're of the record. Uh, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jack, who will speak first in civil engineering, and Charlie and Demetra to speak on the, uh, the landscaping part of it. Uh, the, uh, we are asked for a waiver of a full traffic report. We do know that comments have been made, including in the town engineer's memorandum, uh, stating that there should be at least a, a view or an opinion regarding a left turn lane of northbound traffic into the site. Uh, we do have a traffic engineer, Vanessa and Associates, um, and uh, our request would be uh, if in fact the waiver be conditional upon the traffic report is submitted being satisfactory to the Reading Town Engineer. Uh, and uh, in addition, additional waiver is the waiver of a loading zone requirement. Uh, as we've described in the application, uh, the delivery of materials are tightly controlled. Uh, they can be scheduled by the facility itself. Uh, many of the trips for supplies are trips from employees going out to the supply house to pick them up. Uh, and uh, in addition, of course, the employee parking is to the rear, so there can always be arrangements made for any vehicles that need to be to be using one of the spaces in the back. So for that reason, we're requesting uh, a waiver of the formal requirement of a dedicated loading zone. Uh, as is indicated also, there's gonna be shared parking here uh, between the two buildings. Uh, the parking number does exceed the minimum requirement, but the shared parking would be a positive feature 
to facilitate the use of both of the buildings. Um, and uh, as to the signage question, um, while we like the design on the building, we understand the restrictions of the Reading Zoning Bylaw and our request would be approval of the freestanding sign. Uh, we can obviously talk to the commission later if we look to put the sign on the building uh, to meet the criteria. So at this point, I'm gonna ask if Jack could take it over and describe the site and the engineering features. After that, Charlie will speak on the architectural features. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, for the record, my name is Jack Sullivan. I'm owner of the Sullivan Engineering Group, and I will share my screen if I'm allowed to. Yes. Okay, I tried. Oh, here we go. Okay, that took me a minute. Um, here we go. Uh, this is sheet one of the civil set. And the, the attention that should be shown on this sheet is the zoning table that Brad referred to previously. Shows we're in the business A zoning district. Right in here. Um, it, the use is other permitted principal use. And you can see from the table we show uh, maximum height, front side, rear setback requirements, lot frontage, lot area, max building coverage where um, we meet all the requirements. So as Brad stated, there's no uh, zoning relief needed for any of the um, dimensional um, standards for this site. Go to the next page. Okay, the next sheet, sheet two, is the existing condition sheet. So as you can see on this sheet, on the southerly side of the lot, there's the existing clinic. Uh, there's wetlands that uh, border this site and that come onto the site on the southerly portion of the site. Those were flagged by Norse Environmental Services. The 100 foot buffer extends onto the vacant lot that we're seeking to develop. And as you'll see as we go along with the new building and the parking, we will be required to file a notice of intent with the Reading Conservation Commission. We wanted to come to the CPDC first um, to get feedback to see um, what if any changes might be required before we submit to the um, Conservation Commission. Um, as Brad stated, there's three existing curb cuts along Main Street. It should be noted that Main Street is under control of the Mass DOT. Um, so any sort of curb cut modifications or, and or utility connections to Main Street will require Mass DOT approval. Um, but basically what we're doing right now, there's a circular driveway out in front of the existing clinic that'll be eliminated. And there's an existing uh, driveway that services a house, a single family home to the rear of this property. Um, this is an important feature of the site. Um, the, the single family home to the rear sits on a, a pretty large parcel of land. There's a developer seeking to develop that into single family homes. Um, that proposal has not come to the town's attention yet, uh, but I'm actually working on that one as well. Uh, but as part of that, um, the developer met with our design team on this project. And the idea is that we have to leave access and utility connections to that single family home. And ultimately, um, we're, we're gonna provide a uh, sewer and water easement off of Main Street to that development and it, it'll allow a uh, looped water connection from Main Street to Franklin Street. It'll also allow uh, the owner of this site to tie in with um, water and sewer services. Um, as you can see, the site slopes um, slopes up in topography as you move towards the mobile station, which is over here. Uh, soil testing was done on site. There was a test hole here, here, and here. These soil test holes were witnessed by the engineering department uh, in very good soils for, um, for drainage, uh, very sandy, gravelly soils. 
Um, so you'll see when I get to my drainage discussion, um, it, it's highly suitable for drainage recharge. Um, one thing I should point out, there's a cluster of trees out here. Those are actually town trees. Those will all be saved. We're not proposing to cut any of those trees, but I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention that uh, those, are, those are town trees and will remain. Okay, this is a site plan sheet. This is sheet three. This gives an overview. Here's the existing uh, clinic. This is the proposed two-story clinic to be built here. As we talked about, um, there'll be one single driveway. It's 24 feet wide. We have parking um, on each side, but the majority of the parking is situated to the rear of both buildings. This was done purposefully when we originally met and when I met with the architect and the client for this project, I, I let them know that the CPDC likes to, uh, they don't really like to see parking in the front of buildings. So we tried to situate all the parking either to the side or to the rear of the building. And that allows us to create more green space out front, give a better visual um, to, to the site. Um, we're using vertical granite curbing throughout for the curbing features. Um, we're looking at the uh, gross floor areas for both buildings when we did our parking calculations. So when you combine both buildings, the total gross floor area for both buildings is 13,159 square feet. Based on the zoning bylaw for off street parking, we'd be required 43.8 parking spaces. We're providing 47 total parking spaces for this project, 45 are conventional parking spaces, two will be handicapped uh, parking spaces, one for each building, and each of those handicapped spaces will be a van accessible space. Um, when, you look, when you look at the site, when we come in, we provided flares to go to the uh, north and south. Um, in those flares, we made those turning radiuses, the inside turning radiuses, uh, we made them to meet the requirements for the uh, largest fire truck for the town of Reading. So um, uh, the fire trucks can come in and then they, they can back out and turn around. They don't have to back out onto Main Street. Uh, we show walkways throughout this project and on both properties, we're showing walkways connecting out to the sidewalk area on Main Street. So um, we've, we tried to make this pedestrian friendly um, so for, for anyone walking, they can come right up onto the site um, and you can see the walkways circulate throughout the buildings. Um, one thing I should note is on the northerly side of the property, due to the, um, the steepness and topography, there will be a retaining wall and we're showing a wood guard rail to go on top of that wall. Um, let's see if I missed anything here and I can go on to the next sheet. I think that's it for this sheet. Okay, for the grading drainage utility plans, um, as I spoke about before, we're providing a 25 foot wide easement through our property to, to the rear property. We're showing an eight inch water main and an eight inch sewer service to service the future development to the rear. Um, the utilities for the new building will come off of those and we'll have a domestic water service and we'll have a fire protection water service here and we have them going right into a utility room. Um, as far as drainage, I'm, I'm placing a large underground infiltration field consisting of Caltech units here that will capture uh, the roof runoff and some of the parking lot runoff. And we're also showing a rain garden feature on the southerly portion of the site. There'll be um, the way we're dealing with that is there'll be surface flow across the parking lot. There'll be a riprap spreader area. Water will enter that. Any sediment will be able to be taken out in that riprap area. And this rain garden will be planted and we do have a landscape plan showing how that will be planted. And if, again, you, you'll notice that with, with, with the walkways I mentioned before, we're showing all service connections to the buildings. You can see from the parking lot out front, we have a walkway, have the walkway. 
all through here as well. There will be a dumpster and recycling area here that will be fenced. Um, let me zoom in on that. Let me try to zoom in. I'm not great at this. Oh, there we go. Right, that's a little better. Just bear with me. I'm not used to sharing, the, having to do the shared screen. So this was the dumpster area. The idea with that, it would be a front loaded, um, the, the, the way they work, it, it, it can be front loaded so that they can come in, unload, move out. As I said, it would be fenced. Um, we do show th there will be a hydrant on site right there. Uh, we do show there will be a few, uh, there'll be an 11 foot high post with a light here and over here. And I believe we submitted a photometric plan with our application. And there's some, um, there's some lights on the building as well um, that, that can be shown on the photometric plan. Um, I think that covers what I need to talk about. I probably missed a few things there, but I think I'll turn it over to Charlie, the architect at this time. And then, um, then it'll get turned over to our landscape architect for the project. And then, I'll, then if there's any questions that I missed anything, I, I can follow up when, when they're done with their presentation. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Charlie. Thanks, Jack. Uh, this is Charlie Cochran from Cornerstone Architects. Um, unlike Jack, I am having trouble sharing my screen. So I don't know if there's a chance that someone can bring up the floor plans for us. I can do it. Just give me a And just feel free to tell me when to move to the next page. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so we have been working with the design team to come up with a new structure um, to obviously better serve uh, the, the animal clinic clients. Uh, what we have designed is a two-story wood frame structure that will have a slab on grade foundation. The actual footprint of this building is 6,250 square feet. Um, the remaining square footage is up on the second floor. The first floor is primarily a uh, client service space. Uh, there were some requests on our preliminary meeting to make some changes. One of the main changes on the first floor, we had the fire sprinkler room in the rear of the building that ha has been brought more towards the front of the building closer to Main Street. Uh, the other change that we made uh, was a request. We added a canopy over the side entryway Oh, I can do this. Okay. So right now, uh, this is the side of your way. The parking is along this uh, side of the building right here. So we added the canopy so that people walking along the sidewalk, once they get to the door, would have some coverage. Um, the other change that we did, um, the egress stair that was here, we were asked to see if we could try to change the door location. But based on the roof lines and everything else, it was very tough to do. So you'll see later in the elevations, what we did was we tried to hide the door by adding siding on it, try to camouflage it. And the last thing we did, which you'll see in the elevations, uh, we added some uh, gooseneck lights over the, the uh, signage. Uh, let's see, so the style of the building, if you could, I guess, go to the elevations for a sec. So you see the style of the building is very traditional looking. Um, we do have horizontal uh, siding on it with your typical corner boards, rake boards. Um, on the gable ends of the canopies, uh, we are using a, a shingle style. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the rendering obviously you saw in the beginning show the color scheme that the owners are looking to do. And um, I guess that's it. I mean, I'll be open for any questions later. I want to ask you if uh, the matron would be able to describe some of the uh, landscaping features. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, Julie, I'm afraid I'm also not going to be able to screen. So can you pop up the, the design? Yep. Thank you.
And by the way, I wanted to be clear, I'm not a landscape architect. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Someday you could be. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you remember what it was called, if it was? Well, I believe it's in the site plan set. It's, it's in the site plan. It's on sheet five of eight. Okay. Thank you. I didn't remember that. Let's see. Okay, so it's probably going to be hard to see if you can't zoom in. Um, but basically, the drawing that I did shows um, a very well planted surround of the parking area. Um, the rain garden, which was referred to earlier, is just basically it's plants that can get really wet, sit in water for a while, and then can get dried out. Though they're all natives. The benefit to using native plants is they're tough and they belong here. So they, you know, they work, but they also offer habitat, food for birds, pollinators, etc. And they're very beautiful. Um, these are all in this area of the rain garden. They're all plants that are designed to um, act like a, a wetland plant, which is basically what they are. When it gets higher and drier, uh, the plants um, do as well. Along the back, it's basically a um, couple of beautiful trees and which are not native, but I can't resist a beautiful crab apple. And then coming around this side and hiding some of that enormous retaining wall are a very columnar tree. So they stand as columns. They're a native plant, liquid amber or sweet gum trees. Um, I'm using the crab apples, that number one, sort of as a, as a stitching plant throughout. So there'll be a lot of them. And I'm also using a plant called an amelanchier or a service berry throughout the design. It's a great plant because it can take shade and sun and everything in between. So that's another plant that will stitch this together. Um, along the sidewalks, I just did one sweep of plant. Um, it's an Amsonia. It's really beautiful. It's lovely in the fall. And then it just dies to the ground. So snow removal is not an issue. Um, got a little fancier at the entrances, the front and the back entrance with some evergreens and the like, um, because snow removal can, I figure people can be a little careful at those entrances with the snow removal. Um, in the original building, the one that exists now, along that path, and then this is all very much on the buffer of the wetland, I just like the idea of a sweep of high bush blueberries. Again, they're a native, they belong here, they're beautiful in the fall, they're deciduous, they can take snow, they like wet feet, et cetera. And I added um, clover lawn, where lawn should be. Um, clover is pretty tough and it grows quickly. And it's uh, when it goes to flower, it can be a pollinator, but it doesn't have to. Needs to be mowed a lot less than a typical lawn. And if people are nervous about that, you can add clover and lawn, you know, grass seed, but uh, clover is pretty, pretty gorgeous and easy. And then I did do a number of non-natives that are really designed to get um, pollinators and they're very pretty, just splashes of bright color. Um, so I don't know if you need more detail. I'm happy to talk plants all night long, but I'm guessing you guys don't want to. So. That concludes our direct presentation. We're more than happy to answer any questions that the uh, members of the board may have. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, any questions from the board first? So I just had a relatively simple question. So the original building is staying. 
up um, in addition to the, the new building? I was kind of unclear what the plan was. That's correct. There are two separate lots uh, and there'll be one building on each lot. The only common features are the driveway and the parking being shared. So that raises a good question then. How does the parking work? If Is it two different owners? Or is it one owner for the whole lot? It's two different entities controlled by one person. And to the extent if there is ever a circumstance where one of the lots is controlled by someone else or owned by someone else, they'd arrange uh, probably a reciprocal easement agreement. Okay, so that's critical for that. I'm, I'm wondering you know, about the signage related to that then. Does the one entity count for, for when there's uh, multiple buildings on one lot? Could they actually have two signs, You know, a freestanding sign plus a wall sign? A freestanding sign, which would have both building identities, and then each building would have its own sign, wall sign. Excuse me, wall sign. Uh, you talking about possibly on the on the southerly building, three thirteen twelve, not having a sign and having both be on the northerly building? No, no. Uh, I'm suggesting potentially that there is a freestanding sign which identifies the site, which has a sign for each building, and then each building has its own wall sign. So, uh, I mean, I'll just go back to the original Calarisos, uh, Harrow's building, right? Um, mm -hmm. th there's a free, I guess when there's multiple tenants on one site, you're usually allowed more than one sign. I'm trying to find, figure out if that applies here. It's actually two lots. Okay. Uh, though it's a creative idea. If, uh, if Beth has an interest in the future in merging those two lots, um, but right now there are two separate lots with two identified owners. Okay. Um, but I'm sorry, Robin, did you, uh, Rachel, did you have more questions? Uh, not for now. I was just trying to think about the whole, how it all works together. So, so Nick, if I can have a follow-up question to yours, um, if the, if there's two, actually two separate lots, um, and I wasn't exactly clear the, on the, the parking, how the parking numbers work between the two, but you'd mentioned a shared, it, it's going to be sort of developed as shared parking. I think then we probably need to have a shared parking agreement um, be part of this. We need to, to have that document if each parcel doesn't stand on its own meeting the, uh, the parking requirements. We can certainly do that. And can, can I ask a quick clarifying question also? Um, some, something else. The, the driveway that is at the top of this picture, is does that is that going to stay in continuous, act, continuous use? Is that house occupied? And is the access then through the parking lot? The, uh, the parking, the common driveway, right now does service the single family house behind there. That is only such time as it remains a single family house. If that back land is developed, they cannot go through there any longer. So this will service only these two buildings when that happens. So as I look at some of these drawings, this one and then the landscaping one, it looks like the access to that driveway is being uh, kind of blocked off is that is should are we assuming that it actually is going to be maintained as open and then for now that's correct the two parking spaces at the end of the entranceway will not be used will remain an access to the house behind there until such time as that house no longer uh, exists uh, and then at that time the curbing and those two spaces would be created and, and there's a note on the top of the plan that's on the screen now. We note that access to the existing house at 310 needs to remain open throughout construction and the existing water and server service needs to remain functional until the site is redeveloped. But ultimately there'll be curbing put it when, when you know, the, the ultimate access for the development to the rear of this project will come in off of Franklin Street 
it will not loop out to Main Street. The only thing that will loop out to Main Street is the water main. That, that's why we provided the easement through this property. But you are correct. We have to maintain access to that existing single family home until such time is a development to, to the rear of our site is approved. That's why I show where the existing gravel driveway continues to that home in the rear. Just, you, you can see it, it's basically lines up with the, uh, the driveway, but ultimately that will get closed off. That's the intent. This, this is not to have a throughway out to Main Street ultimately when that land to the rear gets redeveloped. John, what's the, What's the top of wall on that retaining wall? What's the top of wall elevation? The highest elevations at the top of wall is roughly elevation 218. In the, in the, in the, in the ground grade, the low grade is around 208. So the, the highest section of that wall is 10 feet high, which is in the northwesterly corner of, of, of the site. That's, that's the highest point. What is it approximately at, at about Main Street, if that's where it continues to? It's off page here on the- Yep, view. at Main Street, where the wall ends, we come down to an elevation of 210. So that's going to be six or seven feet high at, at the end. Because the finished floor for the proposed buildings at 207.5, Actually, so let's say the grade's around 207.5 at that wall. So that wall towards Main Street, I misspoke, will be around two and a half feet high. But a good portion of that wall, Nick, will will average eight to ten feet high. Yeah, and about how thick is that at the base? You still have access around the bottom of the building? Yes, I have on the. Let me go to my construction detail. I have two screens going, so hold on. Sure. Um, I show on sheet seven of eight. I show it's going to be a Shea concrete wall system. Um, so the base units are uh, 45 inches deep, and then as you move up, they get they get less and less. So there still will be access around the building. I, I tried to show a, a detail of how that wall would be built. Okay. So where where's the property line relative to that bottom unit? Does that have to be completely inboard? Yes. All that construction, including the uh, the drainage material. Yes. Yep. We don't have any sort of agreement with access on on the mobile station site so all the work has to occur on our site okay so maybe five feet so there's about five feet clear at that pinched corner there but that's the right. sprinkler room is way in the front now that's correct okay yeah so the closest point from the building to the lot line is roughly 10 and a half feet and if those wall sections are what did we have 45s 45 at the bottom. Yeah. So let's say four feet to be easy. So that would still leave what almost six feet, even at the pinch point. I think the only other comments I have, I, I think it's a really nice looking building. I think you did a good job there. The materials aren't called out on the on the elevations, so I would I would update those just to show the different materials you're using in the rendering, unless you say the rendering guide. Uh, unless there, you say that the rendering is the um, the actual look of the building. The yeah, rendering is going to guide what the building will look like. Okay. Um, I, it's a little odd to me that the, it seems that the primary entrance is at the front, you know, on the main street side, but then all the parking is sort of on the side and on the rear. And those look like service entrances more than anything else from a plan standpoint, not from an arc, from a look. Right, so that, that looks like when you look at the plan, that's where your waiting area is, and so you'd want to come in there, but then all the parking is on the side and on the back. That was how, you know, again, trying to squeeze the building and parking all in that one site. But that, 
part of the reason why we also introduced having a canopy over that side entryway so that if you're parking towards the rear, at least you have some coverage when you get to a door if it's inclement weather. Do you think you'll actually let people come in on those two doors? Absolutely. The floor plan allows access through there right into the lobby. I think we had received comments at DRT, Nick, that they um, wanted the front of the building to look like a front, even if it wasn't going to be our primary entrance to, to give it that look. Um, town staff could comment on that, but I, I, I think that's the purpose for that. Yeah, no, I get it. It looks really nice. Great. That's all I have right now. Anyone else from the board questions? I don't see anyone. Okay. And yeah, I, I agree. It's a nice looking right. building. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the landscaping or the configuration of the building on the site, um, how about like dog relief areas or right, I guess, um, Right, it's all, <laughs> right, you always need to let your dog go before you bring them into the building. But in sort of the, uh, I don't see how that's gonna happen here. Yeah, I think that the, the lawn area is pretty significant, but then there's in, I think you're right. I think that there's too much plant, planting, um, sorry, it just went away, but up along the parking lot. So I think one layer of plants would have to go and then it's in mulch, which is nicer than on a lawn. Yeah, so yeah. That's an excellent point. And then there'll be room. Um, and then um, did I, it, just so that I understood what was going on, this, the, the center, right, the center aisle um, right now, you said that needs to be maintained for the house that's back there when, when and if something else is developed in the, that back, they would not be allowed to access through this site or at least through that easement. Is that they, will, they will not be allowed to access through the site uh, for any kind of travel. Okay. But if they um, are redeveloping it, is that the primary entrance if they're redeveloping it? I mean, or no, they, they cannot gain access for construction purposes or okay. for normal vehicular access after it's developed. Okay, so only the current property owner as personal use. For one, for one house. Okay. That's correct. Um, yeah. Any other questions from the board? Um, do we have questions, comments from the public, Julie? Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I did get a chat from a um, person named Leslie with a question. I did have a question. Someone mentioned an intention to um, plant crab apples, and I was just thinking. Um, my wife pointed out actually that I believe crab apples are poisonous to dogs. Um, I thought that might be something that would want to be thought about. I do have another question, but of course I can do one at a time. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Yeah, so these crab apples are teeny tiny and they get to, they tend to get devoured by birds. If it's a problem, I can switch it out to something that doesn't make anyone nervous. They tend I'm not sorry. to hit, hit the ground. I just figured I'd bring it up because I'm certainly not an animal expert. That's just a, you know, I just happen to know that. I don't really know the circumstances around how it might be controlled or not.
Um, another question, if I may, um, okay. also I've heard a couple times that the two buildings are gonna have two separate owners. And I'm just wondering if anyone is gonna speak to the purpose, the intended purpose for both buildings being that it, because uh, I'm not sure I understood that. Yes, uh, currently they're two different lots and they've been historically two different lots. That's not changing. The only thing that's changing here is to create a common access way and eliminate a total of three, go from three to one for better traffic control. Because of the fact that both lots uh, can be uh, considered collectively for the purpose of design, we are able to have the parking be shared. Um, but 1312 is not merged with and will not become a part of the lot upon which the new building is located. They'll stay separate. And uh, as has been commented by the chair, uh, we can certainly do and submit a shared parking uh, agreement uh, that can be recorded uh, to protect it against some sort of an event in the future where they are not uh, controlled by the same people. I'm not sure I've answered the question, but that's uh, what, our, what our understanding is. So, uh that <laughs> that built the existing building right um it could um be anything um it could go through for any use within the same use category um leslie and if it changes into a different use category then it needs to come back to uh the planning board to make sure that that use um, uh, doesn't create a bigger impact. So we just sort of like, just like any other building, a uh, commercial building in town, you don't necessarily know what it's going to be used for. Um, uh, but it, at least it has to stay in the same uh, use category. Um, Which means something like office as opposed to restaurant. Right. That does answer my question. Thank you. I didn't really, I didn't know whether both buildings would be used by the by writing animal clinic or whether one was going to be vacant. So thank you. Yeah, that wasn't really answered. So uh, the the identification of the use we, we don't know right now, but we agree that if it changes from a different use category uh, and it requires therefore a different parking requirement, we'd have to come back before the board. Yeah. We have any other questions? Not seeing any. All right. Um, do we have, um, I guess uh, the question is, uh, should we close the public um, hearing? Are there issues that we, I'm gonna say significant issues that we still need to work through? Um, or, um, or I, I guess the reason why I'm hesitating is I thought I heard most of the issues uh, that came up seemed like they could be resolved at the um, staff level with some with some changes to plans being submitted. Um, Julie, do I have that wrong or? Because if, if that's the case, we can close a public meeting and then move on to looking at the, um, at the site plan decision. But if there are still um, substantive, significantly substantive issues hanging out there, then I'd want to just continue. I don't think there are significantly substantive issues hanging out there. Is the uh, rest of the board in agreement with that? Or I should say, if you're not in agreement, please speak up. Oh, the staff engineer is on as well, right? His memo has been issued. Ryan, would you agree with that assessment? Sorry, I was muted there. I agree with that assessment. Okay. Everything can be dealt with on a staff level. All right. 
Um, so I tell you what, I'm gonna, um, I, I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. <clears throat> John, so, could I ask, could, sorry to interrupt, but sure. Jeff Sullivan, Brad, should we, if we close this and we haven't applied to conservation yet, does that create a problem oh. as a procedure moving forward? Well, it would mean we'd have to come back depending on the nature of the change that's necessitated by action by the commission. Um, and I guess, uh, Jack, the question would be if you think that's a real possibility. If it is, we'd probably ask that they not close the public hearing. I I don't think they will. I just, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how they'll they'll act. It's a it's a newer commission. I I think I, they'll be fine with it. But to be safe, I think we should leave it open. I, I'm with you, Jack. I think, right, I, I don't think that's a, I think it would cause more um, effort if we closed it and moved along than if we just kept it open um, and, and made sure that there weren't any um, changes, if, if you guys are good with that. Have you, we are. Um, have you filed with conservation yet? Or not that... yet, not yet. I would, I, I can next week. I just wanted, to, we, we wanted to get into this, this group first. It sounds like we're, we're in, you know, everyone's happy with this plan. We can submit to CONCOM quickly and then have a meeting with them and then come back to you guys to, um, to close this out. So the next, the next CPDC meeting is actually in just three weeks. October 5th, because um, there are many different conflicting um, holidays in October and, and other things. So we might want to consider pushing it until November, unless you think that there's some way you can get to a conservation commission meeting between now and then. I don't think we'd make three weeks with CONCOM. I, I need everything in two weeks prior, and I don't know, I don't have their meeting schedule in front of me. But I would think if it was if you scheduled us for your November meeting, then we should be all set. Yeah. So I think um, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but this could be 7:30. Um, yeah. Yeah. The November meeting, which um, date that is November second. Are we holding that meeting? Isn't that election day? Am I wrong? I think it's the third is oh, election day. The third, day. you're right. Sorry. Mondays. Well, Julie's working on the timing. I have a question for Ryan. Uh, this is Tony DeRezzo. What's the story with the 10 foot town owned property on the easterly side of the, of the uh, site? I believe that was a question in your staff uh, notes. So this is Brad speaking. Uh, interesting history, and actually a lot of the history was given to me by the town engineering staff. Uh, this strip has existed for a number of years from I believe it was the 20s or 30s. Um, and it's been always used uh, by the abutters for crossing, for connection to Main Street. When it was deeded to the town, the deed says it will be used uh, for the expansion or widening of Main Street. Uh, so that was its purpose uh, under which the town acquired it. Uh, we, the issue did come up uh, as to, well, should there be something done at this time? Uh, I should jump one more uh, back a little bit. In, in the 1970s, uh, town meeting actually voted uh, for the town to convey easements to all of the abutters to cross this. That, that passed overwhelming at town meeting, but for some reason, selectmen never signed the grant. Uh, I went back, looked at all the minutes for about two years after town meeting, and it just fell off the radar. It was just an oversight. I have written to the town manager of the board of selectmen, uh, asked to meet with them to see if they either wanna do a grant or maybe town council will rule because of the way the town acquired it, 
that is similar to a tree line on a subdivision, we can just cross it and no action needs to be taken. But we've asked uh, the Board of Selectmen to look into that. Uh, it doesn't affect what we're doing here, uh, but that's the status and the history of it. But if you're moving the current driveway without an easement from the town, can you do that? There's actually a driveway there and right now, Tony. Um, there are three driveways there, and this is located where one of them already exists. Uh, it is correct that it is enhancing the driveway. It's wider than it was before. Uh, but there's been, there was a subdivision approved recently uh, just down the street that crosses the same strip. So the town has really disregarded this uh, by way of one of ownership or obstruction. Uh, and so our, our anticipation is the town will continue with that attitude, especially with the history of the town meeting vote. Uh, so we're optimistic that that will not become a blockage of any kind. But would it be better for the client, the applicant, to uh, actually go to town meeting and get it clarified or you town just want to go forward? Town meeting's already voted. Um, and I don't know of any law that says a town meeting vote uh, become stale or void after the passage of time. It's really a function of, and town council is going to weigh in on that issue. Mm -hmm. um, but it, we're only looking for a confirmation of the continued right to use it. Okay. Thank you for the observation. Though. I was wondering when Tony was going to ask about that. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, um, do, do we have a, or we need a motion to continue to, what was it, November? The second. Second? November 2nd at 7.30 p.m. So move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for 1312 Main Street Reading Animal Clinic to November 2nd at 7.30 p.m. Second. Um, I guess. Uh, we need roll call on this. Um, Nick? Yes. Uh, who comes up next here? Pam? Yes. Heather? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Myself? Yes. All right. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right and Stella. with that, I'm also going to sign off now before we get to the next item. It looks um, and turn things over to Pam. All right. Pam, just unmute yourself, please. Just did. Okay. Okay. Next item on the agenda is public hearing for preliminary subdivision plan, small lane location as proposed by Del Rey Realty Trust. Do we have the full notice? Yeah, I'm gonna just screen share it really quickly and then we'll need a volunteer from the commission to read it. Let me just scroll down. I volunteer, Tony. <laughs> Tony there. Yeah, you picked a wonderful night when I'm having uh, computer issues. Notice of public hearing. Notice is hereby given that pursuant to MGL chapter 41, section 81S and section 5.1 of the Reading Subdivision Regulations, the Community Planning and Development Commission, CBDC, will hold a public hearing on Monday, September 14th at 8.30 p.m. for remote and online measures to consider the application for a two-lot preliminary subdivision submitted by Delray Realty Trust for land located at 1822 Small Lane, Assessor's Map 40, Lots 153 and 155, and 366 Charles Street, Assessor's Map 41, Lot 29 in Reading, Massachusetts. A copy of the application and accompanying plans are available to the public at Town Hall by the appointment and on town website the Thursday prior to the hearing. Thank you, Tony. Do we have the applicant present? 
and online? Yes, we do. Um, I'm Kathleen Desmond from Conway Law. I represent the applicant Delray Realty Trust, Megan Johnson, trustee. Um, Mrs. Johnson's father, uh, William Johnson, I believe is here this evening on her behalf. Uh, Mrs. Johnson resides currently in California and actually this project has an eye toward her returning uh, to Reading and uh, her hometown and, and taking up occupants in one of the um, single family dwellings. I'm here this evening uh, with Jack Sullivan of Sullivan Group Engineering um, and also with our environmental engineer, Maureen Hanley of Norse Environment. Uh, the applicant, Del Rey, has submitted a preliminary subdivision plan for your consideration that seeks to extend the existing private way known as Small Lane, approximately 624 feet for purposes of providing the required frontage for the construction of two single family homes on the parcel of land known as Off Charles Street or 366 Charles Street by the assessor's map. The proposed extension of Small Lane will require the acquisition of a portion of the properties known as 18 small lane and 22 small lane. They have joined the petition along with the owners of 366 Child Street. The project is situated within an S20 zoning district that requires a lot area of 20,000 square feet and 120 linear feet of frontage. It is anticipated that the pro proposed single family dwellings will comply with the dimensional requirements of zoning. Um, an order of resources and area deline delineation was issued by the Conservation Commission in July of 2020. Um, I have submitted with the um, application a number of waivers that we're requesting uh, as part of the DRT meeting. Uh, we've gone through those and had some conversations. So um, some of those um, as we go through um, will, will be eliminated. Um, I think it may be best to have Jack Sullivan run through the project first and give an outline of what the project is and then address the waivers. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jack Sullivan. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, for the record, Jack Sullivan, owner of the Sullivan Engineering Group. Um, do you want to try to share my screen? I, I can go through some plans. Yep. Excuse me. Could I jump in real quick here? Um, I'm the owner of 366 Charles Street, and we didn't join any petition. The personal administrator of the estate of Joan Perry join the petition, which is zero Charles Street. The 366 Charles Street? I believe it's 36 Charles Street on the assessor's map. It's also known as zero Charles Street. Um, it's the vacant portion of land behind um, the lot with the dwelling on Charles Street. Oh, because you mentioned 366 Charles Street. I may, in the assessor's map, it has two different addresses. One of the deeds has 366. That may very well be because it was originally a portion of 366. It's the vacant parcel, parcel two, right. um, owned by the estate of Joan Perry. Thanks for letting me clarify. Hold on, I'm having a little trouble sharing. I'm just uh, checking the GIS to make sure we notify this correctly. Okay, do you want me to continue, Julie? Please. Yep, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jack Sullivan, owner of the Sullivan Engineering Group. Um, we wanted to get in front of the CPDC with a preliminary plan. As Kathleen stated, there's a number of waivers we'd be seeking for this two lot subdivision. Um, we'll, we'll go through those after I go through um, some of the plans here. The, I'll go to the existing conditions sheet. And zoom in. Okay. Uh, presently, uh, small lane is a 50 foot wide private road. Uh, there's 27 to 28 feet of pavement on this stretch. It's off of Dana Road and it shows in the layout a hammerhead turnaround at the end of small lane. But if you've ever been down there, which maybe you have not, it just dead ends. There's no, there's no turnaround as part of this um, subdivision. Um, so what we're proposing to do is extend off of the end of the hammerhead, a 50 foot wide right away 
with a fully compliant cul-de-sac to service two single family homes. Um, I'll go to the next sheet. Okay. Uh, let me go to the next sheet, sorry. Okay, this is the proposed site development sheet. So here you can see there, the, the, the existing drainage system on small lane. There's some catch basins at the end. There's a drain manhole here, and then it just outlets to the wetland. So there really is no stormwater control for this site. There's also a, an existing uh, sewer pump station at the end of this roadway. It's a town maintained sewer pump station. Um, and the existing pavement ends somewhere in here. It just dead ends. What we're proposing to do is extend the pavement, which you can see in, in, in the gray, in, in the hatched gray area. Um, it'd be 22 two feet, to, sorry, 22 foot wide pavement up to a fully compliant cul-de-sac. Uh, the municipal utilities would be extended to the end of this cul-de-sac. So there'd be an eight inch um, sewer main and we're showing a, I believe we're showing an eight inch water main, uh, but it should be noted that on small lane presently, there's only a six inch water main, but we'd be extending and putting a hydrant at the end of the cul-de-sac. In order to do this, um, there is a st uh, stream crossing. It's called a stream crossing, but it's really not a stream, but there, there is a pipe, a, a uh, PVC pipe that's silted in but under the uh, definition of a stream, it qualifies for that. Uh, so we're showing um, a Caltech contactor to be put in at that crossing area to allow passage of water. We're also looking to do a low impact development. We're trying to uh, maintain as many trees as we can. We're trying to limit the amount of wetland filling and replication required for this site. Um, there is some required. This is known as a limited project. And when I'm done, I'm going to turn it over to our environmental scientists to go through um, the reasons we can cross over. But this is basically uh, defined as a limited project. So it allows rights to pass uh, through a wetland area to access an upland area for development. Um, as part of this low impact development, the 22 foot wide pavement area uh, will provide sheet flow off, off the shoulders to over a grass shoulder. So that grass shoulder will allow um, pedestrian movement. We're not proposing any sidewalks in this area. There's no sidewalks presently on small lane. And we're not proposing curbing in this area. And the idea is with a low impact drainage development, water could move off the roadway un unimpeded by any curbing across the grass swale, and then go into a, uh, a crushed stone infiltration trench along each side of the roadway. There'd be crushed stone infiltration trenches. There's been some discussion with the towns then to provide some sort of rain garden feature or some other type of drainage mitigation and exist uh, in addition to the crushed stone swale. We're exploring that, but basically, um, the light blue areas shown on the side, those are the crushed stone infiltration trenches. The yellowish areas here and here are the areas that require wetland filling. And then the purple area, the hatched area, that's our wetland, wetland replication area. Then when you, that one, then when you get onto the, at the end of the cul-de-sac, We'd open up to two conforming lots, lot one and lot two. Uh, they have sufficient frontage and land area and upland areas. So there'd be no dimensional relief needed from a zoning perspective. Um, as Kathleen stated in the open, the wetland flags shown, those have already been approved by the Con Conservation Commission through an NRAD process. So th those are established and they're locked in for a three year period. We do show all trees within the limit of work area for this site that are greater than six inches in diameter. 
um, and we're not showing um, the proposed homes on the lots now, and that's because um, when, when you get into filing with conservation, your fees are based on um, your scope of development and based on the sizable fees that are anticipated for this project for the roadway. Uh, we're just going in, we will be submitting a future notice of intent with the Conservation Commission for the roadway. And the reason we wanted to get in front of you tonight is before we go and make um, that sort of submittal with um, the fee requirements, we wanted to get some feedback from this board on, on this development and some of the waivers that we're requesting. Um, I think at this point, I'll turn it over to Maureen from Norse Environmental just to give a, a quick summary on uh, the wetlands and most importantly, the limit project and how that applies to this site. And then we'll circle back and we can go through each waiver request of this development. Thank you. Hey. Hi, I'm Maureen Harold from Norse Environmental. So as Jack mentioned, um, this is a limited project. It's a limited project under the Wetland Protection Act, as well as um, the Reading Wetland Protection Regulations and Bylaws. So essentially that gives you the right to access the upland portion of your land if there is no other access on the property. So the area with the least amount of impact is what Jack shows on the plan where there's an existing um, silted in culvert and uh, an actual pathway up to the upland portion of the land. We'll be improving that area by meeting the stream crossing standards. So essentially we will remove that, I think it's a six inch or eight inch, it's a 12 inch drain that's silted in and presently failed. And we'll be doing a proposed open bottom culvert that meets the stream crossing standard. So with this design, we try to minimize as much impact as possible to really make it as environmentally friendly as we can. Um, that's why we reduce the wave, the roadway width to just reduce the impact as well as reducing the amount of upland that we have to create for the wetland. So the Reading bylaws requires um, one to one and a half for the replication area. And this project does comply with that as well. So we're able to um, comply with the Wetland Protection Act and the Reading Wetland Bylaws for the project. Okay. And do we have any comment from the abutters or interested parties? Pam, I might suggest you start with the commission first if the applicant is um, done with their presentation. Ah, okay. Thank you. Jack, do you want to run through the, the waiver requests at this point so that the board understands what we're looking for yes. in terms of, of waivers? Yep. So on our cover sheet, we show a list of waivers. Some of these uh, can be complied with, but I'll, I'll go through each one individually, um, and then we can have discussions. Uh, number one, um, requiring topography be shown within 100 feet of the locus. You can see from this site, it's, it's, I think it's, it's over 10 acres and we're developing two acres and the majority of it is wet. Um, so it seems like having to uh, show all topography within a hundred feet of the locust would seem extreme in this case. Um, so that's why we're requesting a waiver from that requirement. Number two, requ requiring delineated bounds of any wetland resource areas on the property or within 200 feet of any portion of the property. Again, that circles back to what I said with the first request is uh, we already have an established NRAD with CONCOM within our work area and to show all the wetland areas in any areas within 200 feet of the property um, doesn't seem to make sense for this project. Um, number three, requiring a full traffic report or study. Again, for a two lot subdivision off of a private way, a full traffic report. Uh, typically, you don't see that being provided, but that can be discussed. Um, requiring an environmental impact report. We are going to provide this, so we're going to remove that waiver request because when we submit to conservation, 
will have to submit an environmental impact report and we can incorporate uh, some of the items that CPDC, or all the items that CPDC looks for in their report in that. So we'll remove that from our waiver request. Uh, we're requesting a waiver from street lighting. We, we don't see a need for that. Um, if CPDC feels differently, we could provide lighting, but right now we're looking for a waiver from that requirement. Um, next, requiring all roadways to be designed in accordance with ASHO recommendations. I'm gonna remove that waiver request. My roadway is designed um, meeting the recommendations. The only reason I requested this is because we only have 22 feet of pavement proposed. But I know in talking with the town engineer in at DRT, uh, most everyone thought 22 was not wide enough. So if, if we have to extend the pavement width, which I think we're going to have to, then, then I can meet that requirement. Um, we're requesting a waiver from the right of way being 60 feet and the cul-de-sac termination being 60 feet in width. So basically we're proposing a 50 foot wide, um, cul uh, we're proposing a 50 foot wide right away and there will be a 60 foot uh, radius termination for the cul-de-sac. So we're really requesting the waiver from 60 feet down to 50 feet for this development. Um, requiring the changes in greater vertical curves of the street be designed in accordance with Ashdow based on 30 miles an hour. I can meet that requirement, so that waiver will be withdrawn. And now we get down to, to the ones that actually probably require some discussion. They all do, but these, these are the priority ones. Requ uh, your subdivision rules and regula regulations require a minimum 30 foot uh, paved way. We're proposing 22 feet. So that, that'll be some discussion. I know some town staff had comments on that, but that, that's one waiver. Um, and the justification for that is just what Maureen said in her presentation, which we're really trying to reduce the footprint. And typically, and especially where I'm not proposing curbing, um, you know, the 22 feet would seem wide enough because with uh, a lot of times you see 24 feet used with curbing, but with 22 without curbing, snow could be moved off and you could still get through, but we can talk about that. Um, next waiver is requiring a maximum dead end length of 500 feet. This development, when, when we extend out to the cul-de-sac will be 624.59 feet. That's to the center of the cul-de-sac. So we're exceeding the 500 feet. So we would require a waiver for that. Next waiver requiring granite curbing to be installed. I explained in my introduction that uh, with a low impact development that um, the granite curbing would not be needed with my drainage system I'm showing. And then the last waiver is requiring sidewalks along both sides of the roadway. We're not proposing sidewalks on either side. A lot of times CPDC wants to see at least one side of the roadway. In this case, small lanes of private way, there's no sidewalks that presently exist on small lane. And we're trying to limit the amount of impervious surfaces. But as I stated in my introduction, there will be four foot wide grass shoulders on each side of the pavement. Um, they could be walked on by pedestrians. They're not paved. And again, that's um, to reduce impervious surfaces. And then a waiver that the town engineer pointed out that I didn't ask for. And, um, we're not proposing to loop the water main. Um, the water main would dead end. It dead ends now. Um, and we did, we did just have um, fire flow testing done on the hydrants. We're still awaiting reports to make sure we have sufficient fire flow for these two homes. And we will get that before we submit definitive plans to this board. Uh, but we will be requesting a waiver from, a, uh, from looping a water main. It will be a dead end water main. Um, so those, those are really the waivers. I think, I think the length of the dead end is a big one that we need to talk about. The width of the pavement, the granite curbing and sidewalks and then anything else CPDC feels is important. If there's some other features that I mentioned above that they'd like to see, I'm, I'll gladly talk about it. And I'll turn it back over to, to the board members now for questions. Okay, questions from the board. 
Hi, it's Rachel. <clears throat> can sorry, can you um put the site to the, the plan that you kind of talk through at the end? Um oh, with with the with the extended dead end to it. I think it's on page three, yep. four. Yeah. So I guess my, my biggest question is is why what was the decision and the thought process around not including the development plans themselves? You started to talk about it, but you know, I guess I'm I'm having a hard time picturing um, what the plan for this is. This is two houses. Is that it? Um, you know, what are what is the thinking for the actual eventual development? Yep. The, the, so the plan development is is for two single family homes. Lot one would would um, would have a single family home. Lot two would have a single family home. The the way with these applications is you when you go through conservation, you can look to permit just the roadway, which we're looking to do, or some developers look to permit the roadway and show, then permit each lot as well at the same time. What happens is when you get into the fees for that, the, the roadway, there's substantial fees just to submit for this roadway. And if for some reason the commission denied our project, those are non-refundable fees. So we didn't want to get it, you know, you start adding the homes, driveways, site disturbance, tree removal on those lots, that, that gets into a higher fee amount that may, you know, if for some reason it got denied, you would never get that money back. So the idea was to come in with the roadway as one application and then come in with a secondary filing with conservation for, for the development of each of those single family lots. So CPDC would be approving the roadway, the stormwater, the utilities, and then the future driveway, house and grading op operations on each lot would get approved by, or at least requested to be approved through conservation. And so, because I'm just looking at the wetland delineation on those lots, and so the next proposal that goes to conservation will have the plans for the houses in, the, in it. We haven't, we have, we, the only thing we've submitted to conservation to date is the NRAD application, which basically is almost what you see here minus the proposed roadways. We go in with the site topography and the wetland lines and the NRAD is really just to, to make a determination on the wetland flagging for the site. So the next plan we submit to conservation will be a notice of intent filing. It'll basically be this plan with the roadway shown, um, drainage improvements, tree removal, limit of work lines, basically what you're seeing here. If I could just add to that, it's cleaner to file it separately because if this does get approved, we need to do a wetland replication area and under the Wetland Protection Act and the Reading regulations, you have to monitor that for two years after it's constructed. So we didn't want to tie that up with the individual single family house lots that may have different homeowners. It's just a lot cleaner to do it separately. Okay, thank you. But is it safe to assume that the construction is going to have to happen inside the little inside the space between the cul-de-sac and the 35 foot buffer line, right? So the houses sit somewhere in there. Yes. And you've got enough setback between the property line to get something in there. Yeah. So the driveway. The, the the homes we we could get the driveway in, um, and we'd have to stay 15 feet off. Um, I can show that I'm sharing the screen. So th this would be the common lot line that I, I have my cursor on between lot one and two. The house would have to be 15 feet off this line. So these homes would be a bit more narrow and, and deeper in construction. Um, and, and then they'd each have their own driveway. They wouldn't be a shared driveway, but we have enough room to come off the cul-de-sac without going inside the no build zones um, as far as w with the conservation bylaws. It's, that's similar to my question. I'm just, I'm just curious um, about what the, what, what the space 
is that you have to work with um, outside of the buffers? Like, what's the approximate acreage that you have to work with, and what size homes? Like, what what's the what's the square footage of the of the footprint that you think you'd be looking at? Haven't got to that point yet, but you can see on you can see like lot one is twenty two thousand seven hundred thirty one square feet of uplands. Lot two has um, a little over twenty one thousand eight hundred square feet of uplands. So upland in particular, right? I so I could, and it was a point Julie Mercier brought up, I think, at the DRT meeting as well, that it would be helpful to see the the we show the environmental setbacks, but to show some of the zoning dimensional setbacks and showing a rough footprint that could go in there. But we didn't want to confuse the issue like, okay, this is what, what's being built. But I believe the owner is looking to construct homes that are upward of 3,000 square feet per lot. Okay, what we're seeing right here is not the full package, however, isn't that correct? They're yeah. total of 13 acres. So to the total site is 13 acres, correct? Right. So what we're seeing is a very small portion that, ter that terminates with this cul-de-sac. But in truth, it's got the same size going over to the right. Yeah, so I just, I just pulled up the, the cover sheet. And it, it, it um, let me try to point to this. So th this is the end of small lane. You can just see how it dead ends. The homes are going up over here, but you can see this site extends way out and way over, over to this side. It's basically all wet. It's, it's all wetlands. So and even where we're building the two homes, it's surrounded by wetlands. We're, we're like up, up on a piece of upland, but all sides off of it is, is wet. So that's why I was saying in, in, when we were going over the waiver request, it, you, this could never be extended to get more homes. Um, it, th there's, there's too many um, environmental limitations with, with the wetlands. In the past, has there ever been any application similar? We're not, uh, we're not done with the board questions yet. Just hold on. Okay. We'll open it to public in a second. Uh, I guess uh, just curious about one of the waivers, really. I mean, I would defer to engineering for any of the more technical waivers, but the waiver for limiting the the um, contours that you need to show, right? We've, we've had some sites where we just don't get to the edge or we just get to the edge of the property and we can't quite understand what the flow looks like beyond that line. So I think it would be important here that maybe you don't need to go out to the 100 foot mark, but we need to see enough contours to understand what's happening with the development. Right, so like right here, you know, this stops at uh, 240, no, is that what it is, 80? Eighty or so, but I, I can't see if it's then starting to go back up or come back down, or I'm not sure what's happening on the adjacent properties to understand what the impact might be. That's usually what I like to see. It doesn't have to be the full 100. And you're, you're suggesting that the full 100 of locus is the full 100 of the site itself, the 14 acres, or just of this circle? Just this circle. I was thinking the full, you know, 12 to 14 acres, because that that is the locus. Um, which, but I, I, I see what you're saying. If it's just in the area of development, I, we, we could show more detail. So you can kind of see the, the, here's the wetland line. So you're not going beyond that and, and it circles the entire site. And then we tried to show coming off here, there's a depression here where water can collect and then it starts going uphill as you go off the site. So there's a low point here, but we could, we could show some more detail along some of the abutting properties if that's a concern. I just think, well, let's listen to see what the public has to say with their concerns. But typically the, the abutters want to understand that you're not going to push water towards them and stuff. Right. And so we need to be able to confirm that. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd appreciate that also for the part that's not shown here, but where you have the pipe that's silted in that you're going to replace with the culvert. And even though 
um, I mean, if there's silt there, that kind of indicates that flow has come from somewhere and is going to somewhere and is, is caused with the silt in. So I'd love to, I don't know, I think maybe if some, some more contour lines can give us an idea of whether or not that's flow, where that flow is coming from and going to. And presumably it's going toward the wetland, but I don't know. Right. And that, that's actually a good point. As Maureen stated, that existing pipe silted in. And I believe the owner at 17 Small Lane, I don't know if they're online or not now, but we, we they've, they've been saying they get water that they never used to get. And that's because water can't get through that pipe. And that's one improvement that will be made. That pipe will be opened up because we're providing an open bottom box culvert through the site that will allow water to drain as it should. That right now it it's not allowed to because that entire pipe silted in. Jack, what's happening to lot 155? To, to say that one more time? What is happening to lot 155? It would be at the bottom of the screen. There's a portion of lot 55 that's being conveyed um, to the developer, but not so much so as to make the lot non-conforming. We've double and triple checked that if, if that's what your question is in that regard. Well, the, the ultimate question is, does the current lot have access to small lane, the, the one that you're developing? By virtue, the, of, by virtue of the conveyance, um, and, and there will need to be some, some work in this regard, uh, but we're going to need um, additional easements, but that will be as part of the conveyance of those. Both 18 and 22 um, have agreements, purchase agreements with uh, the development at this point. Um, and as part of that deed, there'll be a a, 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 you know, a, a conveyance of an easement. Um, my client has also spoken with, it's something we're working on, but he's spoken with the adjacent owner the, across the street and we think we're gonna be able to get easements so that that will have access and we won't be overburdening the existing easement on the private way because it's uh, a private way. So those abutters are in the middle of the- Right, and you would need the agreement of all the abutters. Correct. Owners of the private way for access through to the new site. Right, and we're working on that, but but two of the abutters, 18 and, and 22, um, are, are subject to a purchase and sale agreement, and that will be obviously a condition that that, that deed gives grants rights of access. I'm working with my title insurance company at this point, and also uh, we've had discussions with, with the neighbors concerning that, but two of them are subject to agreement. I guess my question for Julie is, if they don't have the proper agreements in place, can it be approved? Sure. Um, so I think that, you know, I obviously defer to attorneys on this one, but this is just a preliminary plan. So it's still very conceptual. You you could continue the process with the preliminary plan and they wouldn't, if, even if you approve it, they wouldn't be able to construct from this plan. They'd have to return to you with a definitive subdivision plan at some point. Um, and you know, hopefully during the, the time between this process and that one, or during that process, at some point before you issued your final decision, those those details would be worked out. We're aware of that timeline. Um, and certainly by the time we file a definitive subdivision plan, um, that, that will have something for you um, in writing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Questions from the abutters? Um, do, it, if, if the um, owner of 66 Charles Street is still with us, if you wanted to ask your question. Yes. Um, has anything like this been proposed in the past? And if so, and was it denied? And if so, why? Uh, are you asking about this lot, this specific? Um, the two, those two, the, the off a small lane and the two lots um, it, around the wetlands. I, I'm not certain, um, but the owner of the um, the back lots where the, the proposed housing uh, will be that it's out of an estate. So I believe what occurred uh, from my title exam is that um, 
the, the front lot was conveyed, leaving that, that back portion um, as, as owned by the estate. So I don't believe that there's been any other application filed. Um, certainly, I'm not aware of one. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't speak to that definitively. Uh, Keith Dashmont, <clears throat> 392 Haverhill Street. I, I'm not sure if anything was officially uh, proposed, but there was quite a bit of survey done uh, off the Charles Street side, which I think now where there's a house existing, but the lot was, uh, it, at one point, the idea was to put a roadway in there and put development back there. It became unfeasible, I think, from a cost perspective. I'm not sure, again, if it was ever a full proposal, but it seems to me like we've run, run around this deal for a number of years, and whoever is trying to do the development keeps coming to this board and other boards looking for easements and uh, waivers and all sorts of things. So I'm curious, like, why are these things in place? And then the developer gets a chance to kind of to, to back you know, backdoor. Why, why, we, why do we have uh, things in place and then we get to you know, put a waiver on them? I guess that would be a question for the board. Anyone? At this point, I don't have the background to respond to that. Julie, do you have any suggestions? I can, uh, I can speak to a little bit of it. So, um, you know, we have the ability to review proposals by any proponent at any time. Um, what, what happened in the past, whether there was something proposed and it became too costly for that developer to carry out or you know, was um, denied for certain specific reasons, there's nothing preventing even that developer or a future developer from coming back with a slightly different plan or even the same plan, um, at least you know, a, a couple of years into the future. So you know, we're looking really at the merits of what we have before us now. Um, at, with regards to the subdivision regulations, um, they, you know, they have been in place um, since I believe sometime in the 50s. They've been updated here and there throughout the years. Um, we do hear quite often that our regulations are actually pretty, pretty strict um, with regards to the amount of pavement that we require. And, and some, of, some of our requirements are um, much greater than other communities. Um, but you know, what, that, what that does is that gives the CPDC some leverage to say, okay, if, if someone comes in and they can't meet our standards to the fullest and they do request a waiver, you know, what would, what would the CPDC, what would the town get in exchange? So what would be the public benefit or what would be the justification for granting that waiver? And so that's, you know, kind of, you know, all part of the conversation, all part of the equation. Um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically. I mean, I, I guess, you know, to a certain extent, but, you know, when you're looking at sidewalk waivers and improvements and things of that nature, that's a huge cost to the developer. And so it's a uh, great gain for them. How does that benefit the town that they get to drop Two, three thousand square foot homes down there which at this point we don't know if they're on the front of the lot the back of the lot side of the lot you know we don't even know where they're going to be so they're getting all of these waivers and i understand it's a preliminary hearing but it seems to me like it's an incomplete you know plan right now it's, it's, it's a great uh, a great idea uh it's gone around and around and around and no one seems to be able to get it to work back there so for some reason it's not it doesn't seem to me to be buildable but how often does the town or does this board allow for waivers of improvements and sidewalks and things like that that are supposed to benefit the public. Uh, Madam Chairperson, could I take a shot at this? Sure. Go ahead, Tony. I think what the problem is the subdivision bylaws are, are not one size fits all. There will be times when somebody puts in, let's say, five or six lots in which case, off of, maybe off of Main Street, in which case it makes sense that everybody has a sidewalk, you know, that uh, the, the street has to be 40, 40 feet wide because of uh, fire trucks and so forth. And sometimes somebody was just trying to subdivide uh, what is a large lot into two smaller lots. And there are ways of doing that with a cul-de-sac, a shared driveway, et cetera. Uh, for example, right now, small lane, I want to say services, it looks like five lots. And there is no sidewalk, as far as I know, on small lane. There is not. So really asking a developer, and I'm not going into whether this is the correct development or not, just asking a developer who's putting up 
basically what equivalent to one additional house uh, to put in sidewalks when there aren't any for it to connect to, yes, it's saving them money, but it's not even buying the town much, if anything. The traffic is going to be minimal because you're only going to have the two houses, the traffic for the two houses. So anybody walking along the way really doesn't need a sidewalk. But unfortunately, our regulations are designed more for a large subdivision than they are for a small one. But there are other things, for example, the width of a right of way. Uh, that definitely we have reasons for, one of which is that we want to make sure fire equipment can get in and they can turn around and back up and get out. So that's one of the reasons why we're looking for more right of way. We may also say, especially near wetlands, that we don't like to have that much impervious pavement. Impervious pavement means that you're not going to have a reach automatic recharge of your groundwater. It's going to uh, slide right off, go into the drainage, or off to the sides. So what we're trying to do is strike a balance between what's right for the town, what's right for the developer, and what's right for the neighbors. And that's one of the reasons why waivers are requested to kind of try and meet that balance. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, I guess to a certain extent, I would, uh, I would also just say um, a previous board member referenced something about about us being concerned with, you know, water, uh, the table increase or water table increase or flooding in our backyard. So I grew up at 398 Havel Street. I now reside at 392 Havel Street. Probably spent 40 plus years in the neighborhood. Each spring we flood uh, with the development that's been going on in the 40 or some odd years that I've been here. It's just been more and more water coming in. I have standing water in my backyard through the end of spring. This year, obviously, it's a little bit different, but my sump pump typically runs all the time. So I'm very concerned when people come in and say, we're going to delete, you know, move this water and move that water. They put in all the developments uh, out in the swamp further off. Uh, I guess it would be to the north of this development years ago and all sorts of uh, culverts and all sorts of water movement uh, situations and we still flood. So I don't have any faith that anything that's going to be designed is going to help alleviate my water problems. And I can tell you that is a huge concern for all butters, for all projects. Uh, I will say that over the more recent years, I'm going to say within the last 10, uh, the rules have become a bit more stringent, that all water for the site must be handled on site. There will be no more transferring of the water off site, so that they're going to have to come up with drainage plans and retention ponds that can handle the water on site so it doesn't hit, affect the abutters. I just ask one more question. I think someone in several times, Small Lane's been referred to as a private way. Is it in fact a private way? And I can only go by what's on the plan. It says it's a private way. I haven't looked at the deeds uh, for the abutting properties, but I would assume that if it says a private way in the plan, it is a private way. I don't believe get... it's been accepted by the town of Reading um, and, and the title work reflects that it's a private lane. If I could add to it, I think, you know, if you've driven down small lane, um, and Jack referred to this previously, um, that house, house number 22 at the end, um, you basically can't, you can hardly reach that uh, by virtue of, of the street as it currently exists. Um, what we'll be doing is, is improving that roadway so that not only can vehicles get down that road. When I went in, I was actually turning around in people's driveways, um, but we'll be improving the road so that you'll have a cul-de-sac at the end emergency vehicles will be able to access it and it will provide greater access to that that last house house number 22 which is set off basically across from the woods well again my concern would be that you know, we seem to be going around and around for a number of years now with someone trying to develop a very small parcel of land uh, and whatever it seems like people keep trying to get people to bend over backwards to put in a house that works so someone can make a few bucks and i think it's uh, the wrong message thank you for your time thank you i'm not seeing any other raised hands or any other people indicating they have questions or comments um, uh -huh. Unless, let me just see. Yeah, no. Um, I got a 
comment I wanted to make. I'm Caitlin and Ben. We live um, on 21 Dana Road. Um, clothing these sets, um, just because we feel like this land is extremely wet. We sit out back there all the time. Um, there's lots of mosquitoes. We have puddles of water all the time in our backyards and um, in our basement. And there's no way that they can guarantee um, we're not going to get more water from that. Um, plus, there's the wildlife back there, like the deer, fox, birds. They make their home there. Same with the trees. I would want to understand better what trees were going to be being cut down. Um, and it just feels like this area is not intended to be built on. Um, just a really beautiful nest. I feel like it would be a big disruption to the environmental that built there. Um, and what the tree lines and, you know, just to put in a 3,000, two, 3,000 square foot houses back there, just, I just isn't something that we really agree with. Julie, do you see anybody else's hand? I don't. Feel free to chime in if I'm missing you. And Caitlin, what was your address? We're at 21 Dana Road. Dana Road, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, Keith Dantremont again, 392 Harvard Street. I, I would kind of second Caitlin's um, response there. I think my parents live next door to us. I've talked to other neighbors on, on uh, all around us. We're all concerned, not only with the wildlife, there's a tremendous amount of wildlife back there that can be impacted. And, uh, but the, I think the big, uh, the big concern, not only wildlife, is the, is the flooding issues. And I second Caitlin's thought, there's no guarantee that we're not going to receive more water uh, you know, based on uh, someone telling us they're going to divert water somewhere else. I think we're at the low end of the lot. My again, my backyard is underwater more often than not. Thank you. Okay. So, um, are there any other questions from the board members? Any other comments? Any additional information that you want? Um, do you want to talk about the waivers more specifically? Well, at this point- Do we have to vote on them in the preliminary? Yeah. Sorry, Julie. Julie. Sorry. Yeah. Do we have to vote on the waivers in the preliminary approval? That's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Kathleen, do you know? Um, I believe that there is a requirement that you vote on on the um, the the approvals on the preliminary subdivision, um, because e even though it's it's even though I mean the, the ordinance this the statute goes on to say that if you don't vote on them or you don't approve the preliminary that you can still move forward with a, a, a definitive subdivision plan. So I think by virtue of that, that would require that you vote on the waivers that are requested. I guess, I guess, sorry, um, my, I was just looking at the engineering report and the engineering report has more questions than statements at this point. So I just don't know if we're, if we even have the, the right set of information to discuss or vote on the waivers quite yet. I mean, so many of them intertwined with some of the, the questions that the, the engineer bring up. Some of which they've withdrawn too. So maybe we should have an updated list in front of us and have Ryan weigh in on uh, the ones he definitely wants to see. I, I think that when we submitted and, and, and some of the ones that. Um, oh. Go ahead, Ryan. I, I can weigh in on whatever you'd like me to weigh in on. Um, I, I am particularly interested in. Um, the waiver for not looping of the water main, um, mainly because I want to know what the fire flows are at that hydrant because 
DEP regulations um, dictate that that needs to be an eight inch water main, um, which is subsequently coming off of a six inch water main. So that may impact whether or not um, I may need improvements on the existing small lane. Um, currently right now, I think the plans are showing a six inch water main, which will have to go to an eight inch water main because it is serving, it is serving for fire flows. Um, I think one of my comments I also made was that um, because we are matching up with a uh, existing um, lane there, private way, the pavement should match the existing width out there that's currently there, which I think may be somewhere around 24 feet. It is a variable width. Um, and um, again, I, I do have concerns on the effectiveness of the drainage. Um, again, that can be looked at later down the road. Um, but when we're looking at sort of country drainage like this, the concern is that when we do plow the road, where does that snow go? The windrow will be pushed on top of that, that crushed stone and are we gonna get that same sheet flow full, uh, flowing into that crushed stone area? I don't believe we've seen a drainage report yet, so I, I don't wanna fully comment on any of that. Um, again, there are just some engineering, at, at least for on our side that, would, that could wait to the definitive plan, but um, they do need to be sort of looked at during the prelim stages here, just so you are aware of what the waivers are uh, entailing. When you say we plow, do you mean when they plow? This is a private lane. Are we plowing this road? No, the, the, the town generally will plow a, a private way for purposes of uh, trash pickup and for 911 purposes. Uh, so the town does plow a private way um, and they, they push back as much as they can. Um, and so when we do plow that right away, then who does maintain that drainage? What's the O and M plan look like on that? The town's not going to be taking over that drainage, um, and so those are the things that we need to look at when we're looking at uh, the subdivision as a whole. We had discussed um, the possibility of, of a an HOA agreement uh, to deal with some of those issues in conjunction with the, the presentation of a definitive subdivision plan with regard to maintenance of the, um, the, the water and the drainage um, and, and the road with regard to that portion which will be constructed. So if I, if I may just add a, a couple more things, if, if you don't mind. Um, when you're extending that dead end, another reason why I'm looking at that fire flow is that when you extend that dead end and you're not looping that water main, that is also a waiver that's also tied to that. Um, but whether or not you're going to have to do that uh, modification to the existing small lane, which is a six inch. And, and I believe that, that the, the, the testing has been done on that, correct, Jack? But that, that's correct. There's also that as of yet. Right. So the testing was done, the town of Reading Water Department, they were out on site with, with the testing company. And now we've set the results to a, um, a, uh, a water supply engineer to run a report and we'll copy the town on, on those results. Can I ask a quick question? Um, do you have a date that you're gonna file with the Conservation Commission or have you done that already? So no, we haven't filed with conservation yet. I think um, we need to determine the width of the roadway prior to filing because that's going to determine the wetland impact and the wetland replication. Um, so we wanted to come to the, this board first and, and get your feedback and um, before we go to conservation. I have two comments on that. Actually, you can't file until you have access to the site, right? Do you close on the property transfer? No, we could file. We would just need uh, number 22's um, signature as as the owner, but we could still file with conservation. 
Okay. So, so if we deny the waiver for, I'm trying to bring the list up, but the looping the water, if we deny that now because we don't actually have the results of that test to convince Ryan that you can do that, we don't really know the extent of the water main work. If we deny that now, you could come back for your definitive though with proof that it works and potentially we could all buy in, correct? That's correct. I'm sorry to ask a question. I, the, the, could, could you go back over, you said something about, um, I, and I'm just not, I should have written it down, but that the wetlands approval, you said it was something, it wasn't a small project, but something like that. It was something because, something that one can file for in order to gain access to a property that they, that they can't otherwise reach when you have to impact wetlands. Um, did I hear that correctly, that there's a special category of wetlands permitting that you're going to go for? That's correct. So the special category is called the limited project. Limited project. Right. And that basically allows you to access the upland portion of your land if you have no other access, meaning it, there's no other dry upland area that you can use to access that upland portion. So it's not considered a discretional fill or a discretional permit. It's, it's by right that you're allowed to access that upland portion, given that you provide the replication. So and that and, and and this is and that applies even if you don't have like the easement access, even if you don't actually have the legal access to get to your land. We have the le legal access to that portion of the um, the parcel that's being um, developed. The the issue is what our rights are over the remainder of small lane as it currently exists, um, and, and whether or not access of that oh, part, of, which we will have ownership of. Um, whether that would overburden the existing easement um, to, to the existing private lane. So we, we do have to work that out to recognize, you recognize that we have to do that. As I indicated, two of the parcels, 22 and 18, are under a purchase and sale agreement. So that would be part of any deed that was given to us. They would give us the rights over their portion of, of small lane to pass and repass and use for all, all ways that roadways are used for um, because it is a private way. Um, but in terms of, of the actual developed portion of the lot and where the cul-de-sac is, is, is going, that, that's all a portion of what's being acquired. It's, it's only rights to the bottom portion of small lane because it is a private way and there's an argument that you would be overburdening the easement. So you'd have to get, you know, an agreement from the, the other owners that share in that roadway. Yeah. And, and two of them are, are subject to the purchase and sale agreement. So I believe that if we were to file the application and Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, we could get the, those property owners signature as part of the application. So right. that would allow conservation to, to review the application. Excuse me, Vanessa, did you have a comment? They appeared on my screen. Okay, Julie, are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. I think that we need to um, kind of figure out how we're going to proceed with this one. So. Are we going to try to determine tonight what we think the proper width of the right of way should be here um, so that they feel comfortable getting their application together for conservation, um, knowing that their rights of access is still an open question that we'll have to resolve um, at some point before they come in with a definitive and before they get their order of conditions from conservation? Um, or are we, do we want to bring this back to another meeting? You know, and I mean, it's a little, it's a little bit hard, like this one's a little bit tricky because it's a little like a chicken and egg. Normally, 
you know, we would have these things dual tracked and we would have conservation's input um, right up front. Um, you know, we did ask the town engineer to be here tonight in case this conversation got tricky for us to navigate. Um, and he can at least speak from a town engineering and, and roadway design standards standpoint um, about what would be required and what, you know, he would like to see. Um, so it's really, you know, up to you guys. What, what, you, what, you, whether you think we want to try to hash this out right now. It is nine past nine thirty. We do have a hearing scheduled for nine thirty, um, you know, or whether we want to bring this back to to your next meeting um, in three weeks and maybe try to hash it out then. Julie, if I can make a proposal, if we were to basically deny any waiver request that we are uncomfortable with. Uh, that would allow the applicant to move forward. They can always come back for the full uh, approval with the waivers reconditioned, explaining why they should be allowed. And then, or we can just hold off and just wait for three weeks for the applicant to go before uh, conservation. I mean, I guess like from my standpoint, I usually think it's better to, to rather than just flat out deny something, try to, big, try to give guidance and try to help the applicant, you know, with what it is that we want to see um, and see if they can modify the plan and come back with something that could then potentially be approved. Um, and, and if I may, that, that was really our intent in fi filing the preliminary subdivision plan was to get some guidance before the preliminary with a preliminary plan because as you know on a residential you can go straight to definitive um, but we wanted to get some input on the preliminary before we went to conservation um, just because things would change and, and the fees you know are non-refundable and and some of them are, are quite steep um, so we just wanted a sense get a whole picture as, as to, to what um, what the CDC board would want um, in terms of mainly I, I think Jack correct me if I'm wrong but but the two big the two big concerns are the the road width and and the dead end. That's right. So that that's that's bit when we met with the town staff at the DRT, um, a few staff members were concerned with the 22 feet of pavement. So, and if if we make it 24, we don't have a problem with that. It it adds some more impervious. But whatever width we pick for the for the roadway will affect my drainage design. You know, the more impervious, the more drainage I need, which is fine, but that's why we wanted to stop with, start with you guys to see, you know, what everyone's comfortable with for a pavement with, and then I can come up with a drainage solution that works, you know, for the engineering department and for the site in general. But I think, I think Kathleen's right. It's, it's the pavement width, the, the dead end road, the dead end roadway length where we exceed 500 feet, but, um, and then the granite curbing, that, that would be a big one. Um, I think those three items, if there's any feedback we could get on those three, it would be helpful. I don't think the other waiver requests, like we removed a lot of them and I can provide the additional site grading that, um, that some members asked for but I think it's the pavement width, dead end road length, and the granite curbing. And, and we're okay if it's a 24 foot wide roadway, that's what I've seen CPDC do in the past for smaller subdivisions. You know, this is only a two lot subdivision. Um, I think there is a public benefit. I know one of Butter spoke, what, what's the benefit? I, I think the benefit is that we're providing a turnaround on this where one doesn't exist now, that, that is a public benefit. The developer does get two house lots, but there's some expense to build this roadway, to build the cul-de-sac and make, you know, extend utilities and all the things that go into development. So th there is a public benefit with that turnaround. And it, it also assists with snow removal because at this point there's no real way to get in and out of that road. Um, so we're assuming uh, that when snow is plowed, it's essentially smooth, slowed, plowed into that dead end area where the wetlands begin. Am I correct on that, Jack? Yeah. 
question for the town then. When we do plowing on roads like this, uh, and Ryan made a point of this, right? We're not going to manage their private water management system. Uh, do do the plow drivers know, for example, where they can't put snow? How do we notify them, for example, not to plow everything onto the one piece that's actually collecting all the water in the winter? Um, the honest truth is you, you try your best to let them know it's there, but um, that snow has to go somewhere. It's gonna go on the wind route, especially on the straightaways. So it will go, it will go on the edge of the road. Um, so there is a concern with that windrow, if it does freeze, are we going to get that sheet flow to go underneath the windrow into the into the stone? Jack, can you pull up the plan that, that shows um, the more site the site plan? Yeah, sorry. Yep. Up there. Thanks. Yep. So what is your specific concern with the plowing here? Where where they'll push it? So as, well, as you're coming off the end of small lane, I, I think the concern would be where does that snow windrow go, which gets pushed off to um, the shoulder? Right, right. Is it possible to put curbing on a portion of, of the cul-de-sac? I mean, not that they wouldn't push it over the curb, but. I think we could keep them from doing that. Well, related to that, then, does the 24 width give us more forgiveness when um, when we're trying to design these edges as a low impact design, right? No curbs just flowing over the edge, which we've done. You know, we like this in some places. We usually like curves when we're trying to move that water specifically to some collection point. Right. It's a better edge. So if we have a little more width, yes, we have a little more pavement, but they don't have to plow it the full width potentially so that the shoulders, which are supposed to be collecting all of this flow, don't get overloaded in the winter. And so I'm not sure if that can be done, just asking. So when you say country drainage, is that basically just, is that a, that's not a ditch, is that just a road and then a shoulder, like a, like a, a dirt gravel shoulder? Like right, you'd have, you'd have the pavement, then you'd have a grass shoulder, a four yeah, foot yeah. wide grass shoulder. Then it goes into almost like a swale, like, like a ditch, just like you, you kind of suggested it, but it would be crushed stone. So it would be two feet deep and water would go in and then uh, and had really good soils when we did soil testing out here. We have a extremely high groundwater table, but we had real sand and gravels for soil. Um, so water would be able to, I, I have to keep my drainage system two feet above the groundwater table so that when, when water moves through, it can purify before it hits the groundwater table. But th that's the idea with the cr country drainage. It just, it's basically, a gravity system without your typical catch basins, drain manholes, storm scepters. It's almost like a pipeless system. It's it's just yeah. allows okay. it to flow overflow, oh, overland. Yeah. But I don't have a problem if, if this, to increase this to 24 feet wide, and um, I had played around with the idea of some site curbing and then allow gaps in the curbing to allow water to escape. Um, and mainly I was thinking around the cul-de-sac where um, we wouldn't damage any tree lawn areas along the straightaways. I wasn't as concerned, though Ryan might be concerned. But um, around the cul-de-sac, I was thinking maybe some curbing around the cul-de-sac uh, where they're coming in at angles when they plow that, it would at least protect, protect the edges. And then it would make sure water would channel down to where it needs to be collected. But I, I, I think the big that maybe if I suggest I I think I think we're trying to get there, but what 
pavement width would be acceptable to everyone on this project. That That's really the biggest threshold for design. I mean, I'm, I'm okay going with, you know, the, the, a smaller pavement width. I get, part, part of my silence on this is I'm really struggling because it's like, I really want to see what conservation says about all this. And I hear you that you, yeah. you need to, you need to know what to at least approach them with. I think when we're in such an apparently sensitive area, um, going with less pavement is better. I am also really concerned about who's going to be, how will the drainage be maintained so that it doesn't get silted in the way that pipe did. Um, I am concerned about plows tearing stuff up. My, I don't have a curb. My, I'm on straight away. My yard got cut up this, this year. So what you suggested with around the cul-de-sac of at least giving it some bounds, that makes sense to me. Um, those are some of my thoughts, but I don't know what, what do others think here? Yeah, what's the pavement width on small lane? What I measured from catch basin to catch basin on ex on small lane, I measured 27 feet across to the catch basins. Those are offset a little bit back from the edge of pavement. So I think Ryan, when he stated the average width is around 24, it's not consistent, but I would say the average paved width of small lane is 24 feet. My recommendation would be to keep it the same pavement width at small lane. Because right now I'm looking at the drawing and I'm going, a snowplow driver is just going to come in and just keep going at the edge of 24. And even though you came in, he's just going to kill whatever's there anyhow. Yep. And I, I think one, one thing, not to confuse the issue, but I should bring it up now that I thought of it, is in your, in your regulations, I think you require an island in the cul-de-sac. And I know DPW hates islands. We're right. not showing an island. So that might be another waiver. At least it should be a discussion point. Um, I think way back, I had shown an island. And then through the staff process, I removed it. But this is the first time you guys are seeing this plan. So I, I might as well bring it up at this point that we're not showing an island. And I think your regulations do require one. That was in the draft decision as well as one of the waivers that we may require. Okay. So it is in the regulations. I just hadn't mentioned it before to the rest of the board, so. Okay. So I think the question to the board is whether or not we should vote on any of these or all of these waivers at this point and in which order to assess. Well, what's the final list? It looks like we're, we're back at 24 feet. We eliminated Ashto. Traffic study, environmental impact report, you said you were filing you say requiring electrical service and street lighting, but isn't it just street lighting? Yeah, the, the way that section's written in your regulations, it says requiring electrical services. There'll be electrical services to the houses, of course, right. and they'll be underground, um, but it's more street lighting, but that's the way that section's are in, so I just had to write it that way, but it's basically street lighting. You said that there was no street lighting currently on small lane, is that correct? I believe so. I don't remember seeing any street lights out there. I don't there. either. I don't either. So I'm going to say there are none, but if, unless someone in, knows differently in the public, and I didn't see any. I don't recall seeing any when I drove down uh, the other day and took a ride through. Do you guys feel like you're ready to talk about these waivers and vote on these waivers tonight? Julie, we're going to get bombed again. Um, mute everyone. Do you guys think that you're um, ready to, to vote on these waivers tonight? Or would you want to think of maybe like give them some guidance that 24 feet could be could be the width and then um, that, that will at least give them an idea of, you know, what you're thinking about and they can maybe start with their conservation filing based on that. Um, I mean, I don't know if, if this is the right approach or not to 
give guidance without fully voting. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what, what your strategy is. I mean, I'm willing to vote on, on these. I've heard from Ryan and I understand what his needs are. And based on some of the other decisions we've had, so if I were to work actually backwards from this list, right? Sidewalks, we, we never require sidewalks on the low impact developments when it's very few houses and when they don't lead to anything. Granite curbing, we just agreed there'd be some sort of granite curbing. So unless the section reads that it has to be continuous granite curbing, we wouldn't have to grant that waiver, right? Um, the dead end road one that we have to vote on, uh, we talked about 24 feet. So I guess the waiver is from 30 feet, but we're giving them a recommendation of 24 feet. Um, number eight, John, uh, Jack said he's actually meeting the ash tow requirements. So we'll hold him to that. He's going to remove that one. Right. Especially if we go to 24 feet, Nick, then I will. Yeah. Uh, reducing the right-of-way to 50 feet. We've been doing that on pretty much all our developments that are larger than this one. Let's see, street lighting. That's just, so it seems to be that not having street lighting is consistent with that neighborhood. Uh, environmental impact report. I don't remember what we said about this. You are filing one anyways, right? Right. So that's not, a, that's not one. Traffic study for two houses, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that normally. So we could, approve that one, or at least I would recommend we approve that one. Uh, delineating the wetlands, I think you said you did that as well, but just not to within 200 feet of the property. That's right. So the impact area. And then the topography, we agreed that we need to see enough to understand what what's happening at the edges, you know, at the abutters conditions. Mm -hmm. So I guess I don't understand. Would that be a full waiver, Julie, or would we just condition that somehow? Sorry, I was, we... I was looking at something else. Which one sure. Else? If we don't, uh, so the topography, showing topography to, uh, within 100 feet of the locus, which is understood to mean the entire 14-acre property. But we really just want to see it at the edges of this development where the abutters are. Um, if we don't waive it, is there an understanding of what we're asking for? and that there, Or do we have to waive it? with the understanding of what we're asking for. I think you need to waive it with the understanding of what you're asking for. Also, if I could, with regard to the curbing, taking a quick look, quick look at the regulations, it does require curbing throughout. So there need to be some modification of language in that regard. Okay. So if, if the commission wants, I can run through these now. Uh, and then we can vote on each one. Agree. If yeah, you're all ready, I don't want to, I think we've talked through these and we, it sounds like we understand what the town's needs are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number one, requiring topography to be shown within 100 feet of the locus. Uh, my recommendation would be to waive that with the understanding that we're gonna see enough contours to understand what's happening at the edges of the development of, against the abutters. Agree. So I prefer favor. the other way. Which way? That we don't grant the waiver at this point, but we grant it at the definitive subdivision if they have provided enough contour for us. Um, but I'm just trying to understand then what have we approved? It, it, this preliminary plan doesn't show that, right? No. Right. The contours aren't on your current plan. The contours to the extent that section that the section 611B10 requires aren't shown on the plan. So if we don't waive it, how can we approve the preliminary subdivision? Um, I think we'd a have good to one. defer this one right. until we have the information that we need. Because if we uh, waive it now and they come back and they don't show us the contours, do we have an option of going back and saying, I'm sorry, we want to see the contours? 
I don't believe the, I mean, it's helpful and obviously we would hope that the board would, would take into account what, what was agreed to at the preliminary plan. But I, I think at the definitive plan stage, I think you still have the right to consider those issues. To go back on what we approved? I think you, know, you can do it with modif. No, I guess we're not ready then here because my yeah. my understanding of this is if we don't vote on the waiver, then what they're submitting can't be approved. Right. Or, or can it, Julie? Or can we just say we're not granting waiver number one? These plans don't show all that topography. Um, well, let's look at uh, number nine. They're proposing a 22 foot um, pavement. We said we wanted 24. The current plan only shows 22. So how are we approving it under your scenario? We're at 24 if the current plan shows 22. Your, your regulations, oh, I'm sorry. The regulations um, for, for what to submit in the definitive plan and you, the regulations require, so it's a waiver, whether it's 22 or 24, it's a waiver. And we just specify the details of, of exactly how much you're waiving. Right, but the current plan only shows 22. So to next point, if we don't waive the uh, topography, we can still approve the preliminary plan, but they're gonna have to come back on the definitive and show us the topography we want. Right, under, the, under the, the provisions of the regulations, it indicates approval of the plan or approval of the plan with specified modifications and or stated conditions. So you could state conditions that are required as part of the approval of the plan or modifications that you wanna see. That's um, okay. 5.2 of the regulations. Yes. So that would be part of the um, decision for the approval, correct? Correct. Okay, I can live with that. So are we back to voting on number one? Yes. 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 All right. So all remember all the all of the votes are in the affirm or the the motion is always in the affirmative. So if you don't want it, you would vote against the motion. Right? Right. So the motion is to accept the waiver. Right, waiver number one, requiring topography is shown within 100 feet. So all in favor of waiving the motion, uh, waiving uh, the requirement for number one. And with the request. And so we were gonna condition that though, with the requirement that they show the topography within, do we need to specify the distance from abutting land? With enough contours to indicate the conditions at the abutting properties. At, at, but in the development. So we can't give <clears throat> a firm number. Well, I don't, I don't, I mean, you look you at the plan, you can click yeah, all the measure, all but the place, basically, yeah. yeah, we're at the property lines of the abutters, right. right? We need to understand what those contours are. Correct. Obviously, if it's going up, I mean, if we're, if we're heading towards the property and it's up 10 feet, everything's going to flow back down here, we're not impacting that. That's understood. So we don't need to go beyond that. Right. Okay. okay, so that was a motion. I need a second on second. that. Second. Uh, all in favor? Oh, aye. Pam? Yes. Heather? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Tony, do you vote on yes. this? Yes. And Nick, yes. Um, I think so. John's not here. Because John's not here right now. You only need three, technically. Okay. All right. Well, that was five. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, waiver number two, requiring delineated bounds of the wetland resource area. I'm not quite, I'm still not clear on this one. You are delineating the wetlands resource area. To what extent? Laurie? So we delineated the resource area just really around the limit of work. 
So where the crossing is proposed and where it would affect the individual house lots. But uh, the remaining the remaining parcel, which is I think 14 acres, we didn't delineate the entire wetland on that parcel. Okay, and I would imagine that if CONCOM wants you to go further than what you've shown, you're gonna have to do that anyways, right? Correct. Okay, so then I make a motion that the CPDC approve waiver number two requiring delineated bounds of any wetlands resource area on the property or within 200 feet of any portion of the property. Becca. Just gonna mute him, I guess. Um, is there a second? Second. All in favor, Pam? Yes. Tony? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Heather? Yes. And Nick, yes. Uh, waiver for a uh, move that the CPDC waive Request number three, which is uh, the requirement for a full traffic report. Is there a second? Second. Yep. Okay, all in favor. Rachel? Yes. Tony? Yes. Heather? Yes. Pam? Yes. And Nick? Yes. Uh, waiver number four is withdrawn, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, waiver number five requiring electric, uh, electric street lighting and move that the CPDC approve the waiver request for number five to provide street lighting. All in second. second. All in second. favor? Pam? Yes. Heather? Yes. Tony? Yes. Rachel? Yes. And Nick? Yes. Uh, waiver number six has been withdrawn. Correct. All right. Waiver number seven is requesting that the right of way be 50 feet, correct? Is that correct, Jack? The radius is still 60 feet on the circle. That's correct. Okay. So move that the CPDC approve the request for waiver number seven, uh, requiring the right of way to be 60 feet. Second. All in favor, Pam? Yes. Tony? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Heather? Yes. Nick, yes. I don't know why that order keeps changing in my window, though. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's dropping off or coming in. Okay, um, number eight, is that withdrawn as well? It is. Okay, great. Uh, waiver number nine requiring a 30-foot minimum. Move that CPDC grant waiver request number nine with the condition that the roadway be 24 feet wide. Second. All in favor, Pam? Yes. Heather? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Tony? Yes. Nick, yes. Um, and then number 10, requiring maximum dead end roadway width of 500 feet. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Are we all set on this one? I mean, in my opinion, adding the circle makes the road safer, even though it is a little bit longer. and. Yes, I agree. I'll second. <laughs> Are you, did you move? <laughs> okay, great. Um, all in favor? Let's see. Tony? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Heather? Yes. Pam? Yes. Nick? Yes. Um, waiver number 11, move to the CPDC, grant waiver number 11 requiring continuous granite curbing to be installed with the understanding that the granite curbing would be installed in sections uh, of the roadway subject to um, increased wear. Does that sound right? Or increased damage from traffic and Plows. maintenance operations? Plowing in Plows. particular. Plows. Okay. Yep. So is there a second? Second. All right, all in favor, Pam? Yes. Heather? Yes. Tony? Yes. Rachel? Yes. And Nick? Yes. And then waiver number 12, move to the CPDC, grant waiver number 12, um, requiring sidewalks on both sides. Second? Second. All in favor, Rachel? Yes. 
Tony. Yes. Heather. Yes. Pam. Yes. And Nick. Yes. And there was a 13th item that he added on here, which is water flow termination. There's actually two I can add. Um, waiver 13, a section, a waiver from section 7.1.5E requiring a landscape cul-de-sac island. If we can get a motion for that. I just want to confirm that the town's preference is not to have that, the maintenance and, okay. So I'll get a second on that motion. No well, second. Yeah, okay. All in favor? Heather? Yes. I'm so mixing it up now. Pam? <laughs> yes. Tony? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Nick? Yes. So there, I thought there was a um, discussion. Was one of the waivers not to loop the water main? There is a 14th waiver request from section 7.4.1 requiring a looped water main. So in my opinion and listening to Ryan, I, I think that you need much more information on that before we actually grant that one. So I would be inclined not to vote on this, but move that the CPDC grant waiver number 14 requiring a looped water main. Um, is there a second? Second. You have to second the motion, yeah. Pam, just to get out of the negative we, vote. We do? Yeah, yeah, you have we to vote, on, have it, to vote right? on it, right? Yeah, so if you vote yes, then you're allowing them to waive the loop. If you vote no, then you're requiring them to come back. No. Yeah, with more information later. So Pam, no. No. Heather? No. Tony? No. Rachel? No. Nick? No. Okay. Oh. All yours, Pam. Okay. All right. So what's left? on this one now. I think that's everything. Do you, want us, yeah. do you want us to pull up the draft decision? We can just go through. Yeah. Oh boy, yeah. Sorry. I know Andrew was just updating it um, and updating the waivers while you guys were talking about it. Um, so Jack, if you can end your screen share. Yeah. Share his screen. So draft decision here, um, we can of course update these dates and if and when you do vote, we can update that today. Andrew, could you make that a little bit bigger? <laughs> sure can. Is that okay with everyone? That works. A mm -hmm. um, little bit bigger. A little bit bigger, okay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so these materials have been provided. We didn't get a memo from the conservation administrator though we did get an email, um, which I am happy to read into record right now. Let me just pull it up, sorry. It's a little bit lengthy, so excuse me, but the conservation administrator said, administrator said, hi, Andrew, I have not reviewed the plan yet, but a wetland crossing is not automatic certain stream crossing performance standards need to be met prior to approval. This is something that cannot be waived. The road is taking up a lot of usable space that's needed for mitigation of wetland areas filled as part of this crossing. The gravel drainage ditch on either side of the road certainly could be improved and vegetated with a four bay. I see this as a conservation approval first because everything hinges on the approval for the wetland crossing finding and and area for mitigation and meeting the performance standards. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, so Kathleen and Jack, I can forward that to you and note this in the decision as well. Um, Sorry, is it actually four bay, like the number four or four bay, F-O-R-E? It's -E. F-O-R-E, four yeah. bay, F-O-U-R. So. <laughs> no, it's the four bay, it's in front of the <laughs> device. Right. It comes after three and before five. <laughs> You've been homeschooling kids. <laughs> um, I think we discussed this where future plan sets will show zoning setbacks, um, or if they're through the conservation process, perhaps even more than that. Um, 
again, conservation administrator email is just read where he feels some areas could be improved. The proposed right of way width has now been conditioned to be upgraded to 24 feet wide at a minimum. I think this is something we didn't touch on. The proposed cul-de-sac width is 44 feet as it stands, but I believe the town preference is to increase that to 45 feet, if at all possible. Uh, Jack, just so you know. Yep, that's possible. We'll do that. Great. Uh, landscaping details will be provided when a definitive application is submitted. Uh, though we just approved a waiver regarding the street lighting, um, town public safety feels that a street light should be provided at the end of the cul-de-sac because we do get these requests every so often that these cul-de-sacs are fairly dark and they we add lighting after the fact. So we were looking to get out. Yeah, but why didn't you show me this before we voted on that? I thought you oh, looked really? at this before no, you, you voted. I thought you just updated it. You had it since <laughs> last week. That so, particular I mean, paragraph that can change, you know, on the definitive application. So, mm -hmm. as Ryan mentioned, a fire flow analysis needs to be completed and submitted to him. Uh, we expect further details on any lot drainage and roof drains and etc. When a definitive plan is submitted, yep, we don't have that. I did get a Board of Health memo. It's pretty boilerplate, so I can upgrade that date. Um, and I know this is discussed at, discussed at DRTs that there's perhaps thought of a conservation restriction on the re rest of the land, but I'm not sure that we're ready for that conversation yet. So this can be removed from the decision, if all yeah. agree. It's, I think that it could be left in there with the sh word shall consider. Um, I think okay. that's yeah, because I, I, I almost would hate for that to be left to the very, very end, because then it might be, you know, it might just be add time to go through the process to consider it. But okay. There is some town owned land in the vicinity of this site that could be a nice connection. So, so we will leave that then. This is the waivers that you all just voted on. Um, I'll approve 400. This one had the condition that contour line shall be shown to the property boundaries. We might want to modify that language. Yeah, I don't think that's yeah, what that I, is. That's not exactly right. Um, to the abutting property, uh, bound, to the properties abutting the development area. So the way that Nick worded it ori originally, if you don't mind me, uh, yep. Yep. is that we're requesting that enough contours are shown at the edges of the development to understand um, the grading near abutting properties. We can work on this tomorrow. Yeah, I think so. If you're mm -hmm. confident that we understand the gist of what you wanted, we can work on yeah. this. Yeah. Um, all other waivers, this was, waiver two was approved 400. Waiver three was approved 400. Waiver four was withdrawn. Waiver five approved 400. Waiver six withdrawn. Waiver seven approved 400. Waiver eight withdrawn. Waiver nine approved four zero zero with the condition that the roadway width be increased to twenty four feet wide. Uh, period at the end of that. Waiver ten approved four zero zero. Waiver eleven approved four zero zero. Waiver twelve approved four zero zero. And newly added waivers thirteen and fourteen also approved four zero zero. And I'll work on some language here, um, working with the town engine, per the town engineer's memo. Um, so those were, of course, deleted. The conditions are fairly standard for this. Again, I can, these dates are consistent with what was submitted and given to the applicants. 
Uh, one thing we didn't touch upon was parking along the proposed roadway width and um, with it being 20, well, 24 feet wide now, I think there's still concerns on parking on that street. Um, so I believe public safety and feels that no parking sign should be added to the streetway, perhaps not the cul-de-sac, but the streetway extension itself. Um, I don't know if the commission feels differently or has any comments on that. No. I guess in, in the past, I usually advocate for this, but given that the rest of the street is only three other houses, I don't see this yeah. is pressing. Yeah. How are they using I, it, right? I, I'm thinking, I mean, ultimately, this, this will end up being like a really long driveway. And yeah. there, there are three houses. And I, you know, I guess maybe no parking on one side if there's concern about about you know emergency services getting in there during a party or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's but, just but say it, as needed. Yeah, because we really don't know what traffic is going to be like on that road. I think for emergency vehicle access, you might need it on both sides. But I mean, this is something that could be worked out when they submit a definitive plan as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right, so I'll remove this from the preliminary application. I think you should leave it and we'll just reword it. Okay. Yeah, because it is a conversation that was had. To kind of flag it as an issue to determine mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. And that was about everything. Just no requested amendments. Um, Can you actually scroll down to the bottom again, Andrew? Sorry, mm -hmm. I just no, saw no, one thing. Um, the last, sorry, the very last page, the very last condition. Um, okay, well, the development is pending. Okay. Because um, they can't construct off this plan, so. True. But while well, the development is pending, or while well, the property is is vacant. Well, what's this acceptance of the right of way? Oh, the acceptance of the right of way. We, regardless of whether it's a private way, the town would still accept the right of way. No, it would. It's it would. It's proposed to remain private. The town won't accept it. Um, I don't think even if it's increased to 24 feet, but Ryan, I think is still here. He can verify that. Unless he's left already. He might have left. <laughs> Never mind. Um, if he if he left already, he did say that this would not be, uh, he, the town would have no intention of accepting small lane as a, a public way. It has to meet a standard in, and he, he didn't see that taking place. So that we eliminate this last everything after the operations. Last sentence, yeah. The whole last sentence, right? Isn't the applicant is responsible to perform all snow and ice removal operations as well yeah, as? Yeah, wouldn't operations. we just remove the as required prior to any town acceptance? Of oh, the but now didn't you say that you're actually plowing this? That's what I was gonna say. So. Yeah, I all think right. you can remove the whole sentence. Yeah. Thank you. I guess the once over tomorrow too. Yeah. All right. Are we voting on that? Or you feel what? like you are ready to vote on that? That's what I'm asking. Sure. Do you think you have significant edits to make on this? No, I just never got a chance to look at it until right now. So, But I will look at it tomorrow. I don't think there'll be significant edits. Looks good to me. All right. 
Okay. Uh, Do we want to move to approve the waivers as is, as amended? We we approve the waivers, so we have to vote on the preliminary subdivision. Yeah. Um, yeah, and close the public hearing if you haven't already. Yeah. Right, move that the CPDC close the public hearing for small lane proposed extension of small lane. Second. Your show, Pam. <laughs> so moved. So then we, we, vote. we have to vote. Yeah, and then we vote. Fine. Nick. Yes. Heather. Yes. Tony. Yes. Rachel. Yes. Pam. Yes. So moved. And next thing is to close the meeting. Is that correct? Vote on the decision. Yep. Vote on. The Vote on the decision. Yeah. Okay. Talk me through this one. Come on. I move that the CPDC uh, approve the preliminary subdivision plan for small lane extension as amended. Second. Second. Now vote. <laughs> Nick. Yes. Heather. Yes. Tony. Yes. Rachel. Yes. Pam. Yes. Okay. All right. And that sounds like it's time to close the meeting, correct? The meeting is not over. No? No. <laughs> okay. Tell me what to do. <laughs> We have another big thing. We have another hearing that was at 9.30. There was, and? Yeah. Okay. 5.31 Main Street. Thank you, Kathleen, Jack, and your team. And we will get that decision as soon as possible. Thank you. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks so much. All right. So the next item is 531 Main Street, continued public hearing. And do we have a representative from the applicant? We do, we might need to wake them up. Um, I, I, this is Chris Latham for the applicant. Yes. I, all right. Um, if you'd like, I can go ahead and start um, basically a summary of where we are at this point. Already? Sounds uh, good. All right. So since our last meeting back on August 10th, I believe it was, uh, the applicant has uh, made some revisions to the, the plan for the Chronicle, uh, as it's called, at 531 Main Street uh, to reduce the number of units and has also got greater compliance uh, with the downtown smart growth bylaws and design guidelines including um, reduction of the concentration and intensity uh, by dropping the number of residential units from 16 to 12 while maintaining the one commercial space of 638 plus or minus square feet along Main Street. Um, also listened and tried to incorporate uh, some of the suggestions of Select Member Herrick uh, in regards to the environmental and uh, carbon emissions concerns an applicant has added uh, a dedicated electric vehicle uh, charging space um, and uh, is in communications, has been in communications with Reading Municipal Light as to electric utilization to um, see about reducing the greenhouse gases that the, uh, the building will potentially uh, utilize or produce. Uh, likewise, um, the number of garage parking spaces has been reduced from 12 to 16, there's 15 spaces that are required um, and changing the parking configuration with the one electric uh, vehicle charger, as I stated, for one, for one stall, uh, adding one regular stall and adding an ADA compliant van accessible parking stall using new parking lift technology for 13 parking stalls, uh, which maintains the 1.25 spaces per unit. Uh, applicant has provided a sound measurement letter, um, which the board has at the last uh, hearing uh, in regards to the lift parking technology, um, which basically notes that the um, uh, 
the, the noise of the lift system is actually um, probably a, about as loud as a home garage door opener. It's uh, between 59 and 63 decibels. And that's like a noise level that's slightly above a refrigerator. Uh, and it's like uh, basically a business uh, office ambient noise sound. Um, so that's, that's the level of the noise that the system is. Um, the garage handicapped ADA space uh, is proposed uh, feet and 15 inches long and 10 feet wide, van accessible with an additional eight foot wide uh, abutting offloading space. And having the garage aisle width range from 21 feet and seven inches uh, from the ADA and the electric uh, charger uh, stall and regular parking space to basically uh, going down to 21 foot four inches wide uh, for the lift parking uh, spaces or system. So that's the width of the aisle. It, it, it ranges um, in, that, in that range. The proposed garage entrance on Chapin Avenue uh, will continue to be 22 feet and eight inches wide. Um, and <clears throat> we had proposed adding a second uh, street tree on the corner of Chapin and Main. The board has had expressed some concern about line of sight. So we therefore uh, remove that, that additional proposed tree we still have the additional, uh, the other proposed tree at the uh, end of the lot along Chapin. And of course there's the uh, existing street tree on Main Street that we're still proposing to, to keep in place. Um, let me see. Uh, we've added an ADA ramp to the street grade on Chapin. Um, that's near the transformer. And let me see. To address the commission's uh, concerns and inquiries in regards to us putting forth some sort of parking proposal for Chapin Avenue, even though we don't own it, the applicant has proposed a concept plan that has one defined parking space and one defined loading space immediately abutting the property um, on the south side of, of Chapin, the north side of, of our property. Applicant has also uh, provided an updated memorandum and parking analysis uh, that's dated August 27th. And that's in addition to the one that was provided on May 27th. And to summarize, basically the August 27th, it states, quote, the proposed 16 parking spaces are adequate for the um, proposed project and the 700 square foot retail plus or minus square re retail space will have minimal impact on uh, um, street parking. Um, so that's pretty much the summary they had noted in that. Um, and if I may for a second, I've never done this before, so we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, share my screen so that the board can see how the lift parking technology works. Um, hopefully this won't be a total fail. <laughs> so please have patience. All right. Let me see here. All right. All right, if everybody would hold on. basically how how it works um let me see i gotta figure out how to get back to you folks um so at this point i'm gonna try to unsh unshare my my screen and um i'm gonna turn it over to rob who's the team's architect to discuss basically the alterations that he's made uh, to be in greater compliance with the, the bylaw for the downtown smart growth and, and the design uh, guidelines. And then um, I don't know if Ryan is still here or not, but I was hoping that um, at, at, 
if he is here, uh, it doesn't look like he's here anymore. Um, it, we could also, uh, Aaron, our engineer is here and he could uh, potentially uh, discuss any questions that uh, the board has in regards to the engineering of the project. Okay, I'll, uh, I'm going to try to screen share as well so I can walk you guys through the plans real quick. Uh, can everybody see or? Got uh, bringing up the screen share now. You good. Good. Okay. So, um, can you see the see the ground floor? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So here's the garage. Uh, just to kind of rehash what Chris just talked about real quick. So this is the handicap parking lot, electrical vehicle parking spot. We have a regular parking spot here, and then we still have the city lift. Um, units in this location. Um, we have the uh, um, trash room and then some other utilities in this area, basically similar to what we had in the last presentation. Um, again, on the first floor, we have the retail space up here and then residential uh, behind that. Um, similar floor plan here, just the second and uh, third floor. Again, all residential units. Um, and then at the fourth floor, uh, where we made a, more of our major modifications we're actually only doing two units um, on the fourth floor now. So we have a two unit um, in the back, a two bedroom unit in the back, and then a, a three bedroom unit in the front. Um, what we basically did here is we, we stretched these out across the floor plan and reduced by one unit to pull things off of the street further. Um, so in the, the previous go around, uh, we had off of Main Street, a 12 foot six setback. Now we have a 16 foot 11 foot setback and off of Chapman, now we had a, originally we had a six foot nine. Now we have eleven foot five. So we, you know, significantly pulled these units back off the road to to help to reduce the density. Um, skipping down the elevations, so this is the Chapman Street elevation. Um, we have some uh, some small roof decks up here um, that we uh, we had three in the last go around. Now we only have two for the two units. Um, most of this elevation stayed fairly similar. Um, again, this setback here shows you um, how far back we are off the main street now. Um, going to the front and rear elevations, um, again, this elevation or this setback got quite a bit larger from the last presentation. Um, and um, otherwise, we're, we're showing similar um, uh, fenestration here for the retail entry and the, uh, the entry to the residential units. Um, and then finally, this is the Chapman side elevation. Uh, so again, this stayed fairly similar to what we had in our last presentation. Uh, the biggest difference being we, we did have the stair tower over here. Now we just pushed this to the back to kind of help to reduce the massing again off of uh, off of Main Street. Um, also, we, we didn't initially uh, submit this, but we did do some, some renderings to try to give you guys a better idea of what the massing is gonna look like. Um, so I'll just kind of walk you through these real quick. So this is a image of uh, looking down Main Street. Um, so this is the two-story retail space. Um, so as you can see, we have lots of glass in here. This is the overhang and would be the entry to the uh, residential. Um, these are the residential units above. Uh, this would be the uh, second and third floors. And then we have up here the, uh, the units uh, that have been set back uh, for the fourth floor, <coughs> fourth floor uh, residential. This is the elevator tower in the background, and this would be some equipment screening. This is the view looking up Chapman Ave. Um, so again, here, this is this is where the stair tower is, and these are the uh, residential units. Um, this is the garage entry down here. So we have some, some patios off the back here. Um, and then this is the setback uh, fourth floor level. And again, with some small equipment screening in the background. Um, and then looking up Main Street, corridors where we have a lot of our circulation, some equipment screening up here, and then we have the residential units and some small uh, balconies over here, along with the retail in this area and then the uh, residential entry on this side. Um, 
time. So that's an idea of how the buildings are going to fit into the uh, into the surrounding buildings and give you guys an idea of the massing. Um, so that's the the main points. Uh, maybe Aaron, if you want to add anything, all the rest. Of Um, I, I could share my screen and just run through uh, a quick floor plan of the civil here. Uh, my name's Aaron Mackey. I'm with Allen and Major Associates, the civil engineers on the uh, project. Let me try to share my screen here. So just to reiterate a few of the things that uh, Chris had mentioned, this was the concept plan we had done for Chape and Ave. Um, we did have a street tree here at the corner that was a little bit of a concern at the last hearing. Um, that was removed, uh, but everything else on this plan still remains. We still have a tree proposed here, uh, existing tree here. Um, we did, we're now showing an ADA ramp to get down to existing grade um, at this location, but um, everything else on this plan has remained unchanged from the last hearing. Um, I'll touch on the layout sheet. Um, so we have cut the city lift units from seven, seven wide down to five wide. So we currently have the same block of three here, um, which are the 8.5 feet wide by 20 foot long units. Um, and then we have a two by three deep here, which are the eight by 19.3 units. Um, the significance of reducing a couple here, we were able to actually get one unit larger here. So we can accommodate any size vehicles within all these units. Um, so you'll have five stalls in this block of two, um, which is the two by three in your minus one space. Um, and then this block of three, so you have a three by three. So then you'll get eight spaces within this. Um, now they can't cycle together. I know there was a question that came up uh, at the last hearing, um, which we've accommodated for that in the updated parking calculation. Um, you can see here, we have an electric vehicle stall proposed. Um, we envision this to just be a wall mounted uh, uh, charging unit. And we still have the ADA space uh, proposed. Drive aisle width is, uh, remains the same. Um, and the entrance to the garage width remains the same. It's still in the same location. Um, so the layout here is uh, relatively the same. We have a total of 16 proposed spaces where the 15 are required. Uh, dimensional regulations have not changed. Um, and I'll just take a quick touch on the circulation. Um, so with this new layout or modified layout, uh, the garage circulation still works. You know, we, uh, the van stall can still get into the uh, ADA space. Um, and both city lift units on either end, uh, we show access to them. Um, with that, that's, that's the change we've made on the layout standpoint. Uh, I'll pass it back to uh, Chris uh, if you have anything else to add. So, uh, so basically at this point, um, I'll hand it back to the board. Um, obviously we have um, listed in our summary um, waivers that we have requested and um, I can discuss those or we discussed them at the last several meetings, but it, if the board wants to hear them again, I can go through them um, or we can answer your questions. Um, do you still have, I'm not on the board, but I'm just going to say, do you still have as many waivers or is the list been reduced dramatically from last time? Uh, the, the waivers are actually substantially similar. Um, despite the fact that the number of units has dropped, the, the waivers are, are similar to what they were. I know that um, some of the work that Rob did has reduced some of the needs for, um, uh, you know, some of the, he, he's come into greater compliance with the design guidelines in terms of the design itself. And the height waiver will be a lot less of a request, I would think, or at least a few feet less of a request. Yeah, the, at the average, uh, the height above the average grade is, is 58 feet, eight inches. Um, and if I'm mistaken, I'm sure Rob can correct me. <laughs> uh, no, Chris, that's correct, yeah. 
Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Mrs. Chairman, woman, if that's okay with you. Yes, um, please, Jim. I'll just set it out there. I appreciate all the all the work you guys have done. Um, you know, from the very start to you know, from the facade, you know, from from the from the front facing kind of aesthetic, we'll call that, and all the parking work you've done. I look at this and I look at even the renderings you've done, and it still to me overwhelms that site. Um, and I'll, I'll just cut right to the chase. Like, I've looked at the drawings over and over again, and we talk about that top floor being the fourth floor. I can't help but see this as, as a five-story building. And the garage level is also the first floor. We go up and up and up. And I appreciate that you improved the st set, step backs. I think it was on Chapin Avenue. I'm sorry, I've got to zoom into my own version. But like the front, it looks to me like the front step back, I'm looking at what it looks to me, it's like what, what you call the third floor, what I think looks like the fourth floor should be at least five feet. It's not there yet. I, I just, I think more needs to be done to bring it in and bring it, bring it to scale with that site. I will uh, re yeah. Um, I had the same gut reaction, and I just I want to say thank you for doing the renderings because I stared at these the initial architectural drawings over and over and just could not figure out what it would look like from the street um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so the renderings did help on that front, um, and so it's still just it's it's such a narrow site that coming up against the street right there, it's just, it, it really does take up a lot of airspace um, and energy in that area. I guess my second question though is interesting, and Julie, I don't know what the, how this aligns to the smart growth components, but I had initially said when I was talking about this at the first time that you know, you needed to basically either set the whole thing back from the street the way that the current site is, um, or you know, make sure that the retail was truly on the on the street level. And I drove past the site recently, you know, in a slow way, and I just I think there's something about the fact that it is set back further from the street in that location. Um, that in, in some ways kind of hides the fact the size of that lot behind it. And so some of the, you know, there's been some public comment about how this is just, you know, how does this little tiny site fit so many buildings? And I think it's because no one really knows how deep it goes back there because the site itself doesn't look very big from the street. So I don't know you know, my actual inclination in this situation is is to, you know, maintain some of that, you know, front atrium area that is such a benefit to the current site right now um, that actually might do, create a visual breath of air to make the rest of the site not, the rest of the building not so overwhelming. And I, you know, I don't know, again, Julie, if that's, if, if the street setback piece of things, you know, on the ground level is not going to work um, from that. But that was my, my gut reaction with the first architectural drawings and then definitely after the um, looking at the rendering. You're suggesting it should be pulled back from the front to create some some open space in front of the entrance. Yeah, I mean that's one of the that's one of the you know charms of the current site right now is that that area in front of it. And I think as long as it's not way too back, you can still have you know a, a nice um, retail area. And actually, you know, just continuing my thought, given current COVID situations, you could end up with like a nice uh, 
sidewalk cafe area right in front of it that at this moment would be you know a pretty big advantage to anyone at a um, looking for retail space so um so you know. we do have in the zoning there's a maximum front setback of 10 feet um, that's not that much so yeah i don't know if we would quite be achieving like what your what's in your mind's eye yeah with that that might be a lot. That might be enough, though, for the small width of the face of this building, that 10 feet. Right? If you set it back as far as the building is now, there's this like garden space in front of it. I, I guess that could be used somehow. But if it's, if it's private, is it used just by the the business that's on that floor? Or, you know, that makes a difference. But did you submit those renderings? We only got a quick look at them, by the way. Um, yeah, they were submitted. Um, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe a week ago. Um, you know, one thing about the design guidelines, it was, the way I interpreted those was having that street wall for retail is actually desirable um, to kind of- um, You're you know, not wrong. A... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not wrong for the most part. And I'm usually the strongest advocate for you know street level retail right there. But yeah, and I understand what you're saying. About I mean, this it's, site that it, it creates the opposite situation, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's existing like that, so I can understand, you know, looking at something that's um, right against the street can be jarring. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, our, uh, you know, uh, having that retail up front is, is uh, you know, something that we, we think I mean, I don't important. see them in the submittal material. Julie, are they in that on no. folder? Because I don't see them. I didn't see them when I looked at this stuff. I don't think they were added to the drive. My apologies. Packets. I think I left those out by accident. So I appreciated them you showing them now, but yeah, it, it actually left me with the impression that it was going to be as overwhelming as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that top floor. The top floor is really, it's really present even when you back it off the edge. I spent a lot of time walking around 30 Haven Street because. I think it's successful on the Haven Street side, and it's it's tough on the parking lot side, you know, because it's so flat. Um, and I think that your unfor your problem, yeah, your problem, um, the problem with the site is that Chapin Street is sort of sloping down and just increasing the height, no matter what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. my question to you is: You've made it so that there's only two units up there. Can you lose those two units? Because I think that's the majority of of the massing that's causing all the problems, aside from what Robin might be suggesting in front. Rachel. Rachel. Rachel, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's because it's Robin Hitch, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> it may just be because it's like almost 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I have trouble with Hitch and Klish on the same commission. All right. <laughs> um yeah so i mean severa maybe you can chime in on the upper floor units sure hey severio um i i guess we would just get into a, a matter of you know whether or not the project becomes viable at that point at this point we've reduced down from 19 to 16 to now 12 and now we're talking 10 uh to be honest with you by the time we go out to to figure out what this thing is going to cost to build it's it's probably we're probably pretty close to the point of diminishing return where you know we'd have to make a a pretty critical decision um so i i guess the short answer is i'm not quite sure i could make this work at 10 units I appreciate that it becomes really tough, um, but it's also it's it is it's I can't I can't get around um, how how imposing it would be both on the street side and even I also um, I don't know how abutters feel about it, but on the abutter side where it is on the downhill side, I mean that's a residential neighborhood and having that right um, right up against the residential area. Um, I think that would would make it a, a, a less pleasant place. 
as just, I'm throwing that out there, but I, I do appreciate the challenges there um, nonetheless. Yeah, the, the renderings um, didn't break it, didn't um, show me what I want to see, I guess, which was ho hopeful that the massing would really come down with the setbacks because I can, um, your, your views were a little high. So, you know, when you're up against a building, when you're walking the street, you might lose a little bit of that edge of the top floor. But then when you walk down Chapin, you're pretty much picking up that whole building face again. When Dining I look at the room. elevations, if you if you eliminated the one to the third floor and brought the second the top floor down, you know that's probably the right scale right there. But I understand yeah. the economics of it, so I'm, I'm not pretending that it, it's easy. Um, yeah, I mean we wanted to show the, obviously the context of the neighborhood, so to give everyone a you know a full feel of. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that you actually gone. did an honest rendering. You know, you didn't fake it. It's uh, it's from the model. It, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my impression is sort of the rear and the front are what seem to be most um, concerning to everybody. I, I mean, is the shape inside elevation, since that's facing business, maybe not as a concern? Or? I might need to see the rendering again, but that is one where. No, Chapin Street's important too. I mean, you know, we experience all these buildings as we walk past them and drive past them, and then there's residences on that. Um, on that east edge, you know, so they have to look at it as well. Especially uh, when it's the tallest, by far the tallest one around. You're, you know, if you're if you're walking or driving southward on Main Street, you'll see that. Now, I will say, as you as you showed the renderings through, I was like, oh, that actually doesn't look as uh, the step backs. I think work better, seem to work better than I thought they would on that side. But I'd have to look at it again. But I think it still is rather imposing. Yeah, I, can, I can share my screen again if you want to see. I think what's happening is that the narrowness of it is exaggerating the height of it as well. So you're coming down Chapin Street, you're picking up height, and then it's it's all sort of being compressed. And I feel like this has been a lesson in why the floor area ratio matters. I really do. <laughs> why our setbacks matter. Like I said, I, I walked setbacks. around 30 Haven to look at what the front edge was doing versus the back edge. And the front edge, you don't pick up that top floor when you're walking Haven Street. I noticed the exact same back. thing sometime in the last couple of weeks when I was walking by and examined it more closely. Do the, um, if I may, do the board have any questions or, or comments on the lift system at all? Yeah, why do they never show it being loaded or unloaded with cars in the adjacent spots? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see somebody get in and out of their car <laughs> in an eight foot spot with a car adjacent to it. All I kept thinking is like, what happens if you have to run back to the car? <laughs> and what I think about, I actually do have a question. I think about what happens when it breaks down and you've got to get somewhere. Um, and I'm wondering if they've been around long enough to have any sort of um, of reliability record. Hi, this is Aaron again. Yeah, we've been in discussions with uh, the Lyft company, and um, yeah, they've they have a track record. They they've been in business for 25 years, um, and it's I mean they have them all in urban developments, and uh, you know we feel pretty confident that it would be a good fit within this garage and it would work well. Um, in, t in times of retrieval time, it takes approximately 30 seconds uh, to get the vehicle. Uh, once you, each, each resident would have their own key fob um, and they would have uh, a designated space for the, every time they pull in, um, their space would be in the same location at the bottom uh, for simplicity. So they'd scan their key fob um, and their empty space would be there waiting in the same location every time uh, for simplicity. Um, and I know it, it came up on the last hearing as well as uh, if the power went out, we've made accommodations for um, the system to have backup generator power. Um, but we've also been in discussions with the, uh, 
the lift system. And uh, if, if there was no generator power and say the generator was working, you can manually, um, obviously you can pull out the first level of cars, uh, but you can also manually drop the top level. So you could unload two full levels. It would just be the pit would, would require power to be lifted up to the, to the next tier to get out if there was no power, but we've made accommodations um, uh, with backup power. Um, um, so hopefully that answers a few of the questions with the lift system. Uh, also, this is uh, Severio again. I, I think your question was more pertaining to actual maintenance if something breaks down in the moment, just so that you're aware City Lift does have a, a local maintenance presence and they actually guarantee same day service. Yes, that, that was, was part of questions. my right, my thinking and behind my question. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, we we had the same exact question. What if something happens, and how quickly can we get a car out of there? And they actually guarantee same day. Not like well, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's on my <laughs> what's on my mind is this: is that not only for the people who would eventually live there, and it's going to be rental, so they're counting on a landlord to maintain it. That's part of if I got that right. Um, so. I'm also thinking if it's not reliable, they won't park there. They'll 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 park somewhere else. At least that's what I would do. So that's I just want to let you know that that's the the thinking behind my questions. Yep, makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. They have I, I believe, uh, geez, installed in 13 countries, somewhere around 70 or 80 thousand spaces. So it's uh you know definitely a company that's been well vetted and um. They're, they have very high marks when it comes to reliability. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that they're in Tokyo, New York. Um, they're pretty big on the West Coast. Um, we just haven't seen it up here yet. But it has been around. Have you discussed with them the uh, possibility of adding the electric charging to each of the city lift uh, parking locations? Yeah, great question, Tony. Actually, I, I spoke with them about that after our last meeting. All of these units will actually be retrofitted so that they can accommodate a uh, plug-in EV charger. So if, um, if someone wants it, we can definitely do that. That's not a problem. They all come retrofitted, ready to go. So you could eliminate the reserved EV spot. We could, hypothetically, yep. They would, sorry, they would, they would retrofit it for EV at no extra cost. It comes basically fit. It's, um, it's actually really, really simple. It's just a plug-in. So you basically pick the type of unit you want. They mount it in a certain way. And then it's kind of a retractable cord, kind of like a vacuum where you just plugs into this, um, basically like an EV outlet, similar to if you had one in your home, if you had a, an EV unit in your home, you plugged it into like a, like a 40 amp plug or something like that, depending on what type you have, of course. Um, same idea. It just um, it's set up so that you just buy the unit and plug and play. Can we see the uh, renderings again, please? Sure. Bring those up real quick. Uh, you can you guys see them? Yes. Okay. So, uh, is there anyone particularly wanted to look at? Or? Yes, the one, uh, Ch Chapin, looking up, number three. I mean, sorry, when I look at this again, I mean, Heather, that's four stories above. You know what I'm saying? Like that one, two, three, four, right there, it's four stories above. So your count is completely correct. And that's four stories above ground level at the Reading Auto Body. Right. That's why I, I actually see five stories. That top five. story is, yeah. is, you know, I think we've called, I think it's called the garage level. That is. It's the yeah. So this, level. this is the top of the garage, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. or this, the second floor. 
Um, and then we drop down around here. Uh, so this retail is actually lower. And this is uh, you know, the, or the uh, main street. Um, so there's a bit of a bump up to get to the uh, garage. And then, yeah, so this is the uh, first, second, third. So, you know, so for example, okay, so I went back and I refamiliarized myself with the design guidelines and I know there's a, like an auto body place right next to it, but the rest of that neighborhood is a residential neighborhood and our own design guidelines say that, um, I believe it was that setback near a residential area is that the third floor should be minimally 10 feet back. And I think, and again, I think that's why it's like the, the, the step backs really, really do matter. And I know that it's challenging because it's a narrow site, but I'm, I'm just not seeing this working at that height with that top level. We'll just agree and call it the top level. Um, without without more substantial step backs even even on this side I know we I focus on the on the main street side for good reason also but even on this side it's not really working yeah, is there any other uh, renderings you guys wanted to look at um I mean, related to this one, yeah, the, the design guidelines do say uh, when you're abutting residential, I believe it is, that's the, there's stricter setbacks. Um, you know, technically we're not abutting it, but we are obviously close. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is the stair tower, so that's why it's, it's um, you know, close to the lot line to get as much, you know, the full circulation in. Um, and then this is, the, we tried to minimize this over here to to reduce the top of the stair tower to get into this. Uh, so what is that, a 10-foot setback from that top? So uh, the setback here, that one, uh, hold on one sec, let me just check that real quick. From the lot line, that one's about eight foot eight. From the lot line. From the lot line. That's, um, let me just go back on here. Um, so that's actually this setback right here. This area is on the lot line as well as this. So that's on the lot line. Eight foot eight setback here, and then this is setback sixteen foot four. It's primarily due to the um, we had to make room for the uh, transformer, so we took took that uh, you know advantage there to, to set back this part of the, the elevation along Chapin. Uh, so there's an no match in that location. Again, I still can't get past the the top floor right now. But even so, like these these long these tall verticals on this end probably should be broken up by the horizontals that are coming down Chapin on that third and uh, second and third level. Over here, you mean? Uh, I can't see your cursor, but what what do we call the what's the first level above the garage? Is that level one? Yes. Okay, so it's so the level one. Level two has a has a pretty significant horizontal band coming down Chapin and then turning the corner right. and then it sort of stops and then this this has a band at the top of level one but you yeah know, those, okay. those tall verticals I think are exaggerated too much for this end where it should be broken down more so that there's better scale but again it's I just photoshopped the top level off by the way on my computer and <laughs> it's the right scale without that top floor Okay. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, doing the horizontals obviously. Yeah. Okay. Can we see the front again? The rendering of the front. <laughs> You know, I think oh, there will be some very nice. Uh, still looking at the. We're at still the looking at the back. Cut. I don't think we're seeing um, what you're intending to show us. Oh no. Not yet. Okay, it's a little lag maybe. Yeah, or you shared your. Did I have share? Program versus sharing your screen. Sometimes. The oh yeah, I just might want to share the the other window. Okay.
Oh. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Um, okay, so yeah, I was just saying, you know, four floors up here, elevator tower in the background, so that's a little bit higher. Um, you know, and this is going to be, a, I think it's going to be a very nice retail space. This will be awesome. I think it'll, it'll activate the corner very well. Um, but, Dropped out there, Rob. I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. So can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I was just commenting on this retail space being two stories. So I, th I think it'll activate this corner very well. Um, you know, it should, should set up a nice, nice location for, for some nice lighting on the interior and everything like that. Um, so I think it'll highlight it, that It's space, a really but... nice retail space. It is, you know, it's definitely a, a good, it's prime location, et cetera. I mean, we haven't even gotten to my usual request of retail parking, but, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I do think, you know, I'm, I'm not photoshopping, but I'm, you know, visually taking the top story off, and it, it certainly helps. But there still is, it's just something about the massing on that corner, um, and you know. Is that retail space all of that glass vertically? I can't remember. Yeah. For yeah. Floor elevation is just above grade. Yeah. So the the floor elevation will be at grade here, and we'll run yeah. back. And then this whole space, basically, this is the, the floor above. So how tall is that windowsill, that grade? How tall uh, is that from the floor? That, I don't know off the top of my head. I think what's throwing Rachel off, potentially, is that it reads as, as a two-story space, but that, and I like that there's a lot of glass there, but I'm just wondering if that two stories is a lot of face or um, for the plane to be stuck up against the lot line like this. And I wonder if that's what you're seeing. Although I am intrigued by Rachel's idea of pulling this back and having some kind of a pocket of space out there. I mean, it's, it's what makes that, like, nobody knows how long that actual site is because it doesn't, you don't have any clue of it from the street at the moment. And so, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, reducing this in size is, is certainly something we can look at. Um, you know, setting back um, may present some challenges with the parking we'd have to try to figure out um, and how, you know, that have a pretty big ripple effect. Um, but uh, but I know I understand what you're going to That's at grade. Uh, is it possible for that glass to come down and be something that can be opened? So yeah, the, I, the pocket of space happens inside, potentially. Uh, I'm just thinking about how we use, how we're going to use space now, right? There's all these new rules about things. You, you can't sit at a bar right now, but you can't even go get drinks without having to order food. And most people want to be outside, and we're trying to find space for people to be outside. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a lot longer situation than people can imagine. But I also think it's a habit we're going to get into and we're going to want as an amenity rather than like this punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Soon it's going to be, hey, great, I can sit outside. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a, it's kind of a nice habit, kind of a, of a lousy yeah. situation. And I look at this and I'm, I'm reconciling this with what I know our design guidelines say. And, um, and uh, you know, I, Rachel, I tend to agree with you where it's like this corner is an awful lot of concrete without a lot of shade. Um, you know, it'll get physically hot um, and kind of actually a little bit, especially if it if it's not a good place for a tree to go because of sight lines. You know, maybe maybe that's another solution to work with just the scaling and um, an enjoyability of it, just to look at and walk by and and be with. Julie, you're still there? It's 11:10. Uh, I'm not sure where you want to go with this. It's up to you guys. We could continue it to the next meeting, which is October 5th. I think we have a slot for it um, at 8 o'clock. Am I right about that, Andrew? Yes, 8 o'clock slot is now available. 
it's just, you know, maybe you guys agree on the direction that you want the applicant to go with this and to give guidance for what the discussion might look like next time or what kind of information you would want for next time? I mean, I think I think all of us are saying the same thing, that the, the, the massing is, is too much. So we'd like to see some creative renderings of how to, you know, reduce that either in, in a visual way or in an actual way, whichever one ends up working. Um, <clears throat> so that this, this is just not such a, a mammoth imposition to, to the downtown. It seems like, you know, we've talked about, you know, adhering with more consistency to the to the step backs or other creative solutions that create even a little just more kind of usable, you know, outdoor space at the street level. I think we've shared some ideas. Is that enough to go on? I guess is a question. I don't want to be too vague. No, I mean, the scenario. Sorry, Rob. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah, just, just so that I, uh, so that we're, we're, I guess, fully understanding. Um, clearly, the fourth floor is a problem. We, that's loud and clear. Um, but I just want to make sure because you know the consistent message over the first two meetings and through design review team and everything else was connect to the street, connect to the street, connect to the street, connect to the street, and now it's disconnect from the street, disconnect from the street, disconnect from the street. So I just want to make sure that. Uh, I, I guess we're headed in the right direction and not moving the goalpost uh, in a way that we can be creative and that, um, you know, I, I think Nick was on to something with trying to connect that, you know, utilizing the space maybe in a way that uh, connects spatially a little differently with the street, but um, maybe not moving it back so much because there is a massive ripple effect in attempting to move this thing back. Um, so, you know, obviously we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board in terms of work, reworking the massing as best we can and and coping with the fourth floor and seeing what we can kind of rework. Um, but if the expectation is that we're gonna present a building that's stepped back, you know, 10 or more feet in the next meeting, then I, you know, I don't know that we're gonna be able to meet that expectation um, and still have a viable project at all. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big, that's a big uh, bite of the apple, so to speak. So I just wanna make sure that we're doing uh, our best to meet everyone's expectations and, and uh, you know, achieve a, a positive outcome here, so. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm always the one that's gonna say that activating the street is the key factor here. And I think one of the things that got to this confusion is, is the lack of the rendering until this point. I think it was very hard for us to visualize what it was without something that was visual. So Correct. Um, I think that, um, this is a reaction to finally being able to picture it in the space. I, I personally am, I'm not setting a directive in terms of do this, take it back 10 feet, whatever it is. I think the way that I would say, show us creative options that reduces this mass feel to it. And so if you have different solutions that keeps the street activated there, but doesn't, you know, um, take up so much visual space, um, then happy to look at it. Um, and similarly from the back angle as well, you know, I think that we are open to seeing something that you can come up with. Um, and, you know, with the caveat being, let's make sure they're renderings that we can really work with. Yeah, and I, you know, and I also want to, uh, the, and, uh, I don't know how much kind of directive I'm giving either, but you know, on the front side, I'd say aim for the step back of actually five feet, and or you know, think about how some some of Rachel's suggestions to get a little bit of outdoor space. And I think about it. I also think about it in the context of the existing site, and I don't think it's terribly consistent inconsistent because I remember at the very first meeting somebody lamenting the loss of that. Um, little courtyard there that adds yes. that adds a break in the um, in the in the hardscape 
um, and how sad it would be to lose that. So I hope it's not totally inconsistent with some of the concepts and thinking that we've offered through the discussion. No, certainly not. And in a perfect world, if we had a bigger lot, I mean, it would be great to keep that courtyard. It is a beautiful feature of the property. Um, unfortunately, in this case, we've got about 5,000 square feet and that that courtyard represents about a thousand of it. So <laughs> it's about 20% of the building. So it would just be a massive amount of space. But um, yeah, in a, in a perfect world, it'd be, it would be wonderful to be able to do that. And it's a challenging lot. And I think we all appreciate that. I think I would look at potentially lowering that glass and having the wide band between that and the top level, which might break up the scale of this this um, concrete piece, if you want to call it that. But bringing the glass down will engage the street so that if you don't pull it back, that's your connection. And if it's openable, then that, that might represent something different. On the back side, on the shape side, I think you need to look at what you're doing here in front and potentially wrap that around to break up that whole mass. You know, because you just have these these sort of dead blocks. It sort yeah. of comes around. It gets to the transformer corner, which is great. Lots of glass broken up, but then it just sort of stops. And that might be exaggerating the top floor. Although I'm still not convinced. You know that it is isn't going to be this big mass there. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a shot from closer up to you, by the way. If you can get a a shot from like that second garage door on the left there. Because I think then we could start to look up at the building. Yeah, sure. We can take some a closer shot, uh, and you know, those are good suggestions. We'll we'll try to work those in. Hey, if you lose two units, you have more parking. <laughs> you have one point six. Uh, at this time, do we have any additional comments from the abutters or interested parties? Anybody online? Pam, I see uh, it. Leon has his uh, hand raised. Yeah. Who does? Art Leone. Uh, he owns next door, right? Ah. Oh. Mission of Deeds. Art, are you there? You have to unmute. We don't have everybody muted, do we? No, he Somebody is else unmuted. Tries? Oh. He is unmuted, actually. It wouldn't be the first time we put somebody to sleep. Oh, no, you know what? But Art's on there twice. And one is muted and one is not. Oh. I don't know if he's, if he's calling, for, if he's joining from two different devices. Maybe. Can we have what somebody is... else from the public just speak so we can understand whether we're actually hearing anybody? Hi. Hi, this is Jill. Hi, Jill. Thanks, Hi, Jill. Jill, Jill Thank do you. you have comments? Yes. Um, one comment is um, it's like an, it's going to be like an echo chamber in that area because everything's all concrete. I was just um, a little bit concerned about the garage noise and the transformer. I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention that um, everything's concrete down there. So everything is going to be a little bit louder. And my other um, difficulty is with the height. Um, you know, if some of the, if the units got reduced to like six to eight, you know, we wouldn't have the height issue we wouldn't have the parking issue. We wouldn't have to have the cityscape and all the requirements would be met. You know, I'm still having a very difficult time with the skyscraper in the, in the neighborhood, how large this is. Um, and I had a question about the tree that's going to be on the corner between the auto body and the end of the building. That just seems unrealistic in such a busy area, although I love trees. But um, my main concern is, is the height and, and the noise. That's all. So, Thank you, yeah. Joe. 
Thank you, Jill. So, Jill, I just wanted so we, um, I think that the the owner brought this up before. The aspect that we always have to balance is that, you know, at some point, we can't say only six units because the the owner has to make the project economically feasible. So the cost of building it and purchasing the site has to balance out with what he or she can achieve with the units in the building. So it's hard for us to say, you know, you have to only have eight units because in in actuality, when he runs the numbers, you know, that may not make it economically feasible to, to build. So, you know, I think that's why we're giving these directions of saying the height isn't working without being clear, you know, you must drop it down to six units um, so that they can go back to the drawing board with the with the numbers um, and our directions at the same time. Thank you. I'm Triglioni. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> um, I'm the owner of the building uh, adjacent to this structure. Uh, the Mission of Deeds building. Yes. Uh, I'm extremely concerned about a couple of things. If you look at this uh, rendering, you can see that the shadow is 90% across Chapin Avenue. And I'm concerned that the sunlight is going to be robbed inside Mission of Deeds. And I'm also concerned about residents in that structure if it, it comes to pass that are going to park in my parking lot. Uh, the retail space, everybody knows that the parking on, on Main Street is very, very difficult. So the easiest thing for them to do is to come and park in my lot, which people from the restaurant across the street do that quite often. So I'm extremely concerned about the additional traffic that that could bring into my parking lot. For those of you who haven't seen Mission of Deeds prior to the, this pandemic, uh, with our 150 volunteers that we have, a parking space in my parking lot is just not easy to find. So. Any person that is not um, a legitimate uh, visitor to any of the uh, tenants in the building is going to be a real problem for us. So I just wanted to voice my concerns. But if you look at Chapin Avenue, you'll see a, uh, a shadow that goes 90% across the street. And I'm concerned that it's going to rob all the sunlight out of our, out of Mission of Deed space. Thank you. Do we have a, a shadow study on this? And then, Julie? Yeah, we, um, that, that shadow line you see in that image is actually from the existing building. From the uh, existing building, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's got no, no sunlight then. Yeah, and we did do a shadow study. It was the shadow study that we did was from the original submission, so it's it's improved slightly from what we what we showed because uh, we did reduce the, the fourth floor, but it's it's pretty close. Um, but that's not what's shown in the in the rendering. No, no, not in the rendering. So that's that not. he has no sunlight, basically. Well, um, there's a time the shadows yeah. are going to move. Pam. Yeah, yeah true. There's sunlight in the winter when the sun is low, but yeah, you right. can see where it's like that's the, the, the shadows there yeah. are the same for the auto body clinic as the as the location of this project. Yep. Yeah, so it, it there'll be more shadow in the building, certainly. So I, it, you know, it is a good question that I brought up before, but is there, you know, in general, when we add retail, we add this to the smart growth. Um, design guidelines to do best efforts to have associated parking options. Um, Julie, is there any street parking next to the building on Chapin? Is that? 
Is that unallowable? I don't know what the street. So currently, I can um, I can do my best to describe what happens currently. So the the there are, I believe there are no parking signs along the side of the Mission of Deeds building, um, and that there's informal parking that happens along the edge of the proposed. Um, nothing at this time is formalized. And there is an open question before you guys and before the parking traffic transportation task force and ultimately the select board as to what what we would do with this area um whether we would encourage formalized parking on both sides um we would encourage keeping the sidewalk on one side and having formalized parking on the other or sidewalks on both sides or some parts of a loading zone that could be used maybe by um both people moving into this building as well as Mission of Deeds deliveries um, and other uh, entities in the neighborhood. And there's a bunch of different ways that this could be um, reconfigured. And, and it's really like having your the CPDC's feedback on that. And, and the applicant did provide a plan, kind of putting some ideas out there to start the conversation. But having your feedback um, to bring to the internal working group of staff known as the parking traffic transportation task force would be would be really helpful um may i make one more suggestion or one more comment sure. i'm concerned that when a fire truck comes north on main street to take a right hand turn onto chamber avenue that there may not be enough space with the building as it is now uh, as close as it is to Main Street. Years ago, they took the last uh, space right on the corner in front of my building and uh, precluded parking there so that a fire truck would be able to turn down Chapin coming south. But it seems to me that this building is quite close to Main Street and they may not have enough space to take a right hand turn onto Chapin Avenue. Good. That's a good point. The, I don't believe the fire department staff, we typically have two or three people from the fire department in our um, development review team meetings, as well as in the parking traffic transportation task force meeting. I don't believe they've brought up that concern. Um, we can we can run it by them and get back on that if that's something that would be helpful. Thank you. When I have the, the, the proposal. I mean, I do think that doing some creative ideas and strengthening even just the, the one block of, of the building and the Mission of Deeds building to have real sidewalks and real parking and a loading area on that area would be an improvement for everyone in, in that zone. But I don't know what I don't know what's available space wise or can can the applicant bring up that plan that concept plan? Well, that concept plan does start to change the road turn. So that was something the, the fire department would have to weigh in on as well. Right, because they're, they're sort of deepening the, the uh, corner, the south corner, so that the parking fits, I think. Uh, sure. I, this is Aaron again with Alan Major. I can bring that plan up uh, if you would like, Julie. So this was the proposal. We we were going to maintain the curb line on Main Street and actually improve the radius here um, greater than the existing radius, which this is, I believe this is 15 and the existing was only 10. Um, so I the, the building, the building as proposed wouldn't affect the turning movements for a fire truck making this turn. Um, if anything, uh, in this proposal, we can we can increase this radius on this turn to help help the movement. But that's something we can study out and discuss with the fire department down the road. Um, but definitely, we could we can improve the turning movement uh, just by increasing this radius here at the corner. Um, and anyway, we couldn't touch this corner on the other street because it's pinched by the building. But uh, on our side here, it looks like 
we could increase the radius a bit um, to help that movement. And that looks good to me. I think I would look into having yeah. it be a little time limited loading space so that you could use the parallel space, both parallel spaces during business hours or even better um, during restaurant hours in the evening. Yeah, and hey, this is Severia here. Yeah, we, we had initially proposed this because we figured, you know, some of the abutters would benefit from this too right now. I know Neil has a lot of, you know, deliveries coming and going and cars queuing and stuff like that. And then Art has, his stuff coming and going with 150 volunteers that's quite an undertaking he's got over there but um you know having that that loading space could benefit the the you know everyone who's in close proximity but of course this is up for proposal and we're just trying to um you know suggest maybe a path forward for how to formalize some parking and add parking here where parking currently does not exist Is it feasible, and this is a question for um, the abutting property owners, especially maybe art, but is it, would it, is it feasible that if there were a loading space on this side of Chapin Avenue that um, deliveries for Mission of Deeds would take advantage of it rather than parking in the travel way to unload? Well, when Mission of Deeds gets deliveries, uh, the trucks, into our parking lot, specifically when we get a uh, trailer load of beds, they'll pull right into our parking lot and they will unload it at the uh, at the customer at the customer pickup door, first door next to our front door. It's a loading dock, uh, so we don't need uh, deliveries to be made on Chapin Avenue. So even if your parking lot is full, like they're still able to make that work. Well, they'll, they'll pull. Yes, they'll they'll pull right down the center of uh, the parking lot, and we'll just have some, uh, the the beds inside the building. Uh, we don't have a fork truck or anything, but uh, we'll have four or five people working on it at the same time. We have had some um, initial feedback from the police department that they prefer not to have loading spaces um, uh, in the public way. And I think there is a, a preference for as much parking as possible. But, you know, I mean, I think that conversation is still open at least, a, at least a little bit. We haven't really talked about it in great detail. Um, So can I make a suggestion just because it is 1130? I think we've provided a lot of feedback um, on the, the kind of the building. And I think we've got some open questions on this parking that probably need to be looked into. Um, you know, are we at a point that we can, that you guys have enough feedback to uh, you know, direction to put something together um, and bring it back to us. I believe we do. Yeah, this is Severio. Yeah, for, certainly from my. And I guess Julie and Andrew, do we have some open questions on parking and uh, I'm going to call it traffic, but uh, <clears throat> that we can help look into and, and provide them with some feedback on it. Yep, I think we'll request that this concept plan be reviewed at the next September PTTF meeting so we can provide better comments for them. Great. All right, Pam. Yes, <laughs> so we need to then uh, <clears throat> ask them to go back to the drawing board to make some adjustments, come back with, uh, again, rendering so we can see them, and uh, figure out if we can get the uh, parking 
from the exterior. Is that right? Yep. So Resolved. We we'll just need a motion to continue. And yeah. if the applicant still the October 5th meeting works for them, the eight o'clock time slot is open. Is there a That's motion? Fine. Can they make October 5th? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, moved at the CPDC continue the public hearing for so, um, October. what's the address? 531 Main. 531 Main Street to October 5th at 8 p.m. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, All in favor? All in favor then. <clears throat> Nick? Yes. Heather? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Tony? Yes. Pam? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. So now, can I close the meeting? Nope. <laughs> uh, one no. more. <laughs> there's, there's there, yeah, there's one more thing you need to do. One more thing. What? It's on the agenda. There's a withdrawal of an application. Yes. Um, so there's a withdrawal of the <clears throat> site plan review for 258 to 262 Main Street, Reading CRE Ventures, LLC. The application has been requested to be withdrawn without pre prejudice. Correct? Correct. Yes. We have a motion to approve that. <laughs> so we just needed a motion to approve the withdrawal? Yes. Yes. So I, tell me if I get this right, I move to approve the withdrawal of, where did it go? 258 to 262. 258 to 262 Yes. Is there second. a second? Second. Okay, let's go back through this again. Oh, Nick? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Heather? Yes. Pam? Yes. Tony? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Off. Off the screen. Okay. <laughs> All right. And is there anything else? Uh, I think that's it. I think that's it. 531 Main. Okay. Good. Motion. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn is next. So move. You made a motion. Second. Second. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Tony. Yes. Nick. Yes. Heather. Yes. Rachel. Yes. Pam. Yes. Andrew. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks all. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Nice, nice Thank you. to see you. Good work. Good to see you. Good night. Thanks, Pam.